Hello, everybody. Thank you and welcome back. So um, with me, I actually have a few of my colleagues and uh, co-leads from the Red Team Village. Uh, first of all is Savannah, uh, live from Vegas, and Barrett, and also Desync, uh, or Danielle. Uh, she is actually handling most of the Discord uh, operations uh, for us and has been instrumental not only during yesterday, but throughout the the life of the Red Team Village. So thank you, thank you for your support. So with that, I'll pass it to Barrett to do the first announcements of today. Sure, uh, we are finishing up the qualifiers. We ran that for a bit uh, yesterday. A lot of high scores. I think that AI generated was in the lead. We're gonna get the scoreboard up here in a sec. In about 13 minutes, we're gonna open it back up for two hours. We have a few more challenges to throw up there. And, uh, and then, unlike uh, in the previous year, we're going to go ahead and close out qualifiers right in the middle of the day here and then transition into finals, announce who, uh, who made the cut. Yeah, no, we're looking forward to everyone uh, competing in the finals. So it'll be the top 20 teams, and they're the ones that will go on to compete today. We, uh, want, we definitely want to ask, so when we make that transition to finals, if you have anybody, if you're in the top 20 teams, if anybody on site, 
uh, come down to the contest uh, area at DEF CON and meet up with us so that we can make sure that we get some face-to-face uh, -face interaction. We can, uh, we can assign a face to uh, all the different usernames we keep track of. And uh, you know, we have some swag to give out. We want to thank our sponsors for, for really making this possible. Uh, we've got a, a lot of things to help educate the folks who follow the Red Team Village. Today, we've got quite a few interviews where we're just going to talk about you know, some, some different red teaming things, talk about how to get into red teaming, and uh, we've got a full schedule today. Yeah, no, we're looking forward uh, to everyone joining today to see all the interviews that we're doing. So you can see the schedule right there that Omar is sharing. So we have a few interviews that we're going to be doing today. Awesome. And uh, Danielle, if you don't mind actually giving us a little bit behind the scenes of what's actually happening in Discord, uh, what are some of the top you know, questions that you're getting and a lot of the activity there. Sure, yeah. Uh, so I want to throw out a reminder that uh, all the communication about this ETF needs to happen on the official DEF CON Discord, and that's going to be in the CE-REDTEAM-CTF-TEXT channel. And if you don't see that, make sure you go into the Roles channel and subscribe to the context uh, contents, contests and events. <laughs> Uh, emoji there. When you click that, you'll see a bunch of new channels open up for the the uh, contests and events, and you'll you'll find our channel there. Um, so to reduce the clutter in the official Discord this year, they've they've made it so you, you can sign up for particular pieces, so you're not constantly getting inundated with alerts. So um, all the questions are going to be flowing in there from the participants. Um, shout out to Johnny C and a couple of the other RTV folks that we've got um, keeping a watch in there, helping some of the newer people. Um, they're always instrumental in um, uh, in walking through some some people who have never done a CTF through uh, a lot of the intro, some of the trainer boxes, getting you started. Um, our CTF is very noob friendly, so if you've never done one, don't be intimidated. Jump on in. There's plenty of things that you can do. Um, yeah, we encourage you to ask questions. If you're actually competing for one of the top spots, you may not get the hints that you're wanting. Remember to try harder, um, but we encourage you to participate, and we look forward to hearing from you. Awesome. Thank you so much. And back to Barrett. When are we expecting to have the new challenges open? You mentioned in 10 minutes or so? 10 minutes. 10 minutes. We're going to open a new challenges. We're going to get the qualifiers back up. So anything that you were working on yesterday, you can pick up today. Um, I also want to put a plug out for uh, what we did yesterday and today with some of the giveaways. We gave away three AWAE um, uh, test uh, attempts as well as 60 days of lab. Today, we're giving away three OSCPs, thanks for uh, thanks to Offsec for that. Um, the way we're gonna do it is we're going to put a link on this stream that'll take you to a survey, and then we'll do a random drawing. We also have a SANS course for the first place finalist tomorrow, as well as three OSEP uh, certification attempts with 60 days left. So stay tuned. Um, we've got a lot of stuff to give out. Please help take this off our hands and, uh, and just watch the stream to, to know when to enter. Awesome. And once again, thank you to all our sponsors. I'm actually just sharing them real quick in Absolutely. here. Without you, has you know, this event will not be possible. And especially yesterday, you know, giving away those three big courses. Uh, I had a lot of follow-ups from the winners yesterday, so they are also saying, you know, thank you. Um, and it was a really cool thing that we actually had a video from one of the official people from Offensive Security. So, Savannah, okay. can you tell me more about her? Uh, yes, yeah, so we had she had come up to our booth at uh, DEF CON in person. And she's just she's one of the co-authors uh, of the course. So she recorded a video with us. I think Omar shared it on uh, social media and then also on the stream yesterday. So she's awesome and really cool. And we're looking forward to having her uh, around this week. Awesome. And thank you to Offensive Security for that. And with that, um, let's go on a quick break. And then we'll come back with a couple of members from our team to to do you know some, some of the interviews that are coming up, um, especially Matt uh, Tylus is actually coming in the in the next few minutes. So let's take a quick break, and we'll be right back.
Knock, knock, who's there? This guy. What's up, red teamers? What's up, DEFCON? It's your favorite fake brilliant billionaire investor. My little birdies, cheap, 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 cheap. I like cheap things, that's why I'm rich. They let me know that Lunar Fire is under fire, but that is a Tres Comas company. And that's got so much smart shit in it. And so it's unhackable. Or is it? No, it isn't. Not even you boy and girl geniuses can do it. You would have to be the human equivalents of cars with doors that open like this or like this. Are you? Can you? Will you? Don't. encourage you to come back and uh, we have many more certifications uh, in offensive security we just launched 365 so that's year-round uh, for many many things and a 20% discount so 
by all means, swing by the website, check it out, and congratulations to each and every one of you who actually got it. Thumbs up, man. Alright, bye everyone. Right, we're back live. So um, back to you, uh, Savannah. Hi, everyone. Uh, so we are releasing uh, more challenges for the quals right now. So we have until 12 p.m. Pacific time. And then once uh, that ends, we'll choose the top, top 20 teams that will go on to the finals. And then I'll pass it over to Barrett. Who wants to add anything else? Yeah, um, looking at the scoreboard, it was a lot of fun uh, checking out some of the uh, teams we've seen before in other, uh, other events we've held. Uh, this is truly worldwide. It's, it's great that we can do this live right now. Um, you know, we can inter interact with some of the students on the floor, but we know these teams are all over. We've got folks from, from Poland, all over Europe. Uh, we know that there's a, uh, there, there's a couple teams from Africa, a lot of teams from South America. And so it's, uh, it's really great that even with the current situation and international, international travel being uh, stunted, that we can still kind of get together and, uh, uh, you know, kind of play in an event like this and, and meet up with some folks. I think it's been I think it's been fairly challenging. Some of the challenges that we have, we try to do a a wide breadth of different things. Want to make sure there's a lot of a, a lot of web content out there. We've got a few ponables, um, you know, some some forensics, a couple of things from the uh, the blue team perspective, going through some packet captures, and um, we will we'll we'll go on in a little bit with our with our first interview. We'll take a break. We would love some feedback from every player out there. So there is going to be a survey link. Uh, we kind of do a cheesy thing where you get points for filling out the survey. Uh, that, is, that is an opportunity for us to always improve what we do. So please uh, take the time to, to go to that survey. Give us some really good feedback. If there's anything about a certain challenge that, uh, that you thought was, was confusing, that always helps us revisit the way that we're presenting the questions and presenting the challenges. Um, anything you want to see in the future? I had someone reach out and said, hey, I'd really like to see more uh, Android apps that we can attack. We've done those in the past. I don't think we had any in quals this time, but that's the kind of feed that, that feedback that really guides our next CTF. All right, perfect. And um, throughout the day, we're going to be making a lot of more announcements for giveaways, as uh, Barrett mentioned before. We're going to take a quick break, but a few things that I want to highlight um, as Danielle mentioned, you know, all communications is actually happening in the DEF CON Discord server. Uh, in the bottom of your screen, you actually see the, the actual channel that we're congregating on. And then the second thing, you see the schedule a link, which is redteamvillage.io slash schedule. And the scoreboard is also very easy, just our website slash scoreboard. So that will take you to the scoreboard that you will just watch or just watch a, a few minutes ago. So once again, the qualifiers part two is actually now live, and we see AI generated still on the top, but uh, that may change. So so stay tuned. We're gonna go in a quick break now.
Welcome everyone. I'm Barrett Darnell with the Red Team Village, and I'm here today with Ryan Dory and Matt Eidelberg from Optiv. Hey everybody. Hello. How's it going? Ryan and Matt, uh, thank you so much for being here today. And I want to uh, thank Optiv for being a sponsor for the Red Team Village CTF this year. Your support really helps uh, and, and it goes a long way at uh, allowing us to provide a big event both in person and virtually. Can you tell me a little bit more about Optiv? Yeah, absolutely. So to put it very simply, Optiv is a pure play cybersecurity partner. And what does that mean? Uh, we, we aim to do secure, all security all the time, right? We can help in ways of advisory deployment and even manage operations, right? So ultimately our, our goal is very simply to uh, help organiza organizations realize a more effective uh, security program and posture. And uh, for, for both of you specifically, what, what do you do at Optiv? So I'm a senior director inside of threat management, which is a larger umbrella, but I specifically have the privilege of leading our attack and pen team. Um, so my focus is on the direction of success of that team. And I achieve this largely by enabling uh, the great folks around me, such as uh, Mr. Eidelberg here. And I'm a technical manager under uh, attack and pen. My primary role is leading the adversarial simulation services. This is our uh, branch that focuses primarily on red and purple team operations. My role in there is not only executing these types of engagements, but also focusing on helping to innovate the team and grow uh, more operators to perform these types of engagements. All right, and uh, and for the for that uh, attack and pen practice, uh, why do you like working there? Yeah, so for me, uh, first and foremost, uh, it's it's the close family atmosphere that we have on the team. Uh, and what I mean by that is I've been on the team for almost nine years now. I've been in Attack and Pen the entire time, and I'm not alone in that. There's several other individuals on the team that, that have been here for a similar amount of time, such as, such as Matt himself. So what that yielded is a really good dynamic uh, of folks to work well together while we uh, simultaneously you know, pursue our passion of offensive security. And just to add on to that, I would say in a single word, the community. Uh, the team itself uh, honestly strives constantly to push the boundaries, to teach each other new things, whether or not it's a, you know, failures from previous engagements to help educate for future uh, kind of tests or even success stories. It's all about sharing and kind of bolstering each other and through knowledge sharing. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, and a plug for that, that giving back to the community aspect, you know, I was on your GitHub the other day and uh, I was looking into Scarecrow and I know I've got that on my list to do a deep dive on after after DEF CON. You know, love, love the fact that, uh, you know, a lot of big players in uh, information security share that research, share that tooling that they create. Yep. That's what we strive to do here. And for your team, um, you know, what types of people work there? What are their backgrounds? So it's a, it's a good variety of backgrounds, right? So we have folks uh, some, from being a, a good part of us being veterans uh, to business-minded folks, to engineering folks, et cetera, right? Uh, but like I mentioned earlier, there, there's the ultimate uh, commonality, right, of, of a shared objective of offensive and passion for offensive security testing. And then what we qualify that success really is, is helping leave our clients better than we found them at the end of the day. And of course, you know, folks have a very specific uh, or can have a specific subset of interest inside the team. Uh, that could be of IoT to embedded to wireless to low level window stuff to evasion, um, et cetera, right? So there's definitely some, some sub pockets for people to really go a mile deep on. Great, and with such a diverse group, uh, what makes somebody a success in AMP? So aside from uh, technical acumen, which obviously is held, you know, it's an important quality on this specific uh, role, right, uh, is the ability to show ownership and leadership and give back to the team. Um, really, you know, owning a specific service or an offering, uh, helping others, mentoring, et cetera, we hold that in incredibly high value. Um, and then as we mentioned earlier with regard to um, like Source Zero and Scarecrow, right, is the, the public thought leadership to help uh, the team immediately and then also give back to the community as well. Yep. And just to add on to that, I would say the eagerness to learn and improve your tradecraft. Um, honestly, the ones we see that excel the most are the ones that not only focus on themselves, but also make sure that they help their fellow teammates or coworkers, whether or not they're struggling with something or helping to help them also pursue and grow their talents. Those are the ones that I see often have the base success here. That's great. Uh, absolutely. I mean, this is this is a team sport uh, doing what we do. <laughs> yep. 
for the for the red team village, one thing that we we uh, really love to do is is offer a lot of uh, environments for training. We do workshops. We 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 uh, participate in a lot of different cons. Um, and one thing you, you know we want to do is bring as many people into this community as possible. And so I'd I'd like to ask for both of you. Uh, you know, what is your advice for people who are interested in cybersecurity as a profession? Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, I'll speak to the, you know the path that I took to get here, and I think it, it holds true to the to the question, right? But I think it's very important and imperative for folks to have a a deep foundational understanding to, as to how uh, things work, right? So what I mean by that is how does Active Directory work? How does networking function? How can you manipulate these things to maybe work outside the bounds it was intended to, right? So that can apply to even development, web applications, et cetera. Um, oftentimes I get asked by people that are a bit younger and say in college or whatever, and they're like, hey, should I take this security class and become a pen tester? Well, I would really encourage folks to get a lot of those more foundational understandings to how things work before they move to the stage of trying to, you know, move to that adversarial emulation type part. Yep, and I would just add uh, to not just focus when you're learning on red team tactics. It's incredibly valuable in the current landscape to uh, focus on both blue and red team. Having that ability to speak both can really augment your skill set. And you know, this is very much a cat and mouse game-based industry. And just knowing both sides, their playbooks, can really help you understand the strengths and weaknesses of both sides. So when you're coming up against, say, a red team or a blue team, you know what they are great at and what their weaknesses are to really help plan out those attacks or even your knowledge set to improve on. Those that is phenomenal advice. Uh, this industry is is a challenge because there's so much breadth and depth that you can take. Uh, not to mention that it's evolving every single day. So it's impossible to keep up. So you've you've got to have that thirst for knowledge. And uh, and without that foundation, it, it is quite difficult. I mean, you might throw that exploit and get that get that shell back, but then the question is, what do you do next, right? And so, uh, great advice. I want to thank both of you for being here today. Uh, thank you again for the sponsorship. Looking forward to uh, to meeting you in person and uh, and also with uh, with DefCon right around the corner. You know, uh, looking to to engage with old friends and 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 make some new ones. So so thank you again. Absolutely. Thank you for the opportunity, and uh, we're looking forward to seeing some folks out at DefCon.
Hi everyone, my name is Savannah Lazara and I am the co-lead of Red Team Village. And today we have Barrett Darnell and Caitlin O'Neill with us from Bishop Fox. And they're gonna be one of our sponsors and we're really thankful for them being a sponsor for our CTF event at DEF CON. And I'll go ahead and let them uh, introduce themselves and we're gonna get them to know them a little bit better today. Hi, I'm Caitlin. I'm with the recruitment team here at Bishop Fox. Uh, I came over here about three years ago because of our reputation as one of the largest professional services firms focused on offensive security and security as a service. It's been a wild ride, uh, but part of why I stick around is because I love working with such brilliant people. I love that we go out there and break things, build new things, break more things, uh, and, and always working with the latest technologies to keep people safe. So it was a really exciting opportunity for us to sponsor the Red Team Village Capture the Flag this year at DEF CON, uh, where we can't wait to meet people virtually and on site and uh, to, to hopefully find some new ways to grow our team. Hi, Savannah. Nice to see you. I'm Barrett Darnell, Managing Senior Operator at Bishop Fox. I'm part of the Continuous Attack Surface Testing Team, also known as CAST. Well, we're really excited to have you guys on this call today. And I would say the first question that we kind of want to start off with is kind of seeing what you guys would say is the best part of being a sponsor for an event like this. Well, for Bishop Fox, uh, we're avid participants of the greater InfoSec community. And we feel that sponsorship of conferences and efforts like this provide a real tangible value to the community. This CTF in particular provides a tremendous amount of realistic hands-on experiences for those in the offensive security, particularly red teamers. Yeah, no, that's that's awesome. And I mean, I'm sure you know this, Barrett, uh, with so many resources out, resources out there. Uh, why do you think kind of sponsoring something like this is so important? Well, for one, uh, this resource is free. So that barrier of entry is out of the way. Uh, anybody can participate. Secondly, it's realistic. It mimics real life scenarios that we've seen on our customer engagements. And so it's not very esoteric. Uh, it's you know real tools, real uh, situations you might be in. And it's also beginner friendly. Um, it starts off where everybody can join and get something out of it, but the difficulty ramps up. So uh, there's a lot for experienced red teamers uh, uh, to hone their skills on. Awesome. Uh, and I know we've kind of just talked about the benefits that people who are joining the CTF would get out of it, but can you kind of talk about the benefits Bishop Fox receives out of being a sponsor for the Red Team Village uh, CTF event at DEF CON? Yeah. Well, you know, first and foremost, we always want to give back to the security community. And uh, this is a great way uh, for us to interact with the hundreds, maybe even thousands of attendees and participants. Uh, whether they're they're in person or virtually. Um, it's great um, from where I sit as a recruiter because it gives us a chance to um, meet new talent, uh, people who we maybe haven't engaged with before. And that's really important, especially as we continue to grow uh, our two new service lines, the continu continuous attack service testing team uh, that Barrett is on and our red team. Yeah, no, I mean, Everybody knows in the security community who Bishop Fox is, and I'm sure they would love to know about the recruitment. So I guess what types of uh, people do you guys typically look, look for for the team? Yeah, so you know what we need, um, what we're hiring for can kind of shift month to month. So in the past, if you engage with us and it wasn't a fit, um, that might be changing. So you know, always stay in touch. Um, first and foremost, we look for people who are really passionate about security because that's definitely who uh, we are. And, you know, we're always looking for um, a diversity of thoughts, a diversity of backgrounds. So, uh, you know, we have a lot of people who came from a pretty like, traditional career paths, you know, school, work, but we definitely have folks who are self-taught, who are coming from non-traditional backgrounds. Um, you know, we, we love our folks from the military as well. So there's a lot of different paths that can lead you to working at Bishop Fox, and we're really open to exploring all of them. Uh, you know, you can always find me on LinkedIn, Caitlin O'Neill, uh, but you can also engage with Bishop Fox on Twitter. Uh, we have an awesome uh, social media gal. We have a really fun Twitter account. Um, we're going to be on site in Las Vegas, and we're going to be using Twitter to kind of help people find us and, and also find us for some cool uh, giveaways as well. So definitely check us out there. Yeah, no, it's awesome. I'm sure everyone's looking forward to kind of seeing Bishop Fox um, at DEF CON. Did you guys have anything else that you kind of wanted to mention on this call uh, before we end it today? Yeah, I mean, I'm lucky I just get to show up as a recruiter and a sponsor. I know that all of you guys with the CTF have done so much work 
So, you know, thank you for everything you did. Uh, I'm really excited to see it all come together. Uh, and thanks to the Red Team Village for this opportunity. We're really excited to meet everyone. And I just want to say, uh, you know, after months of being on lockdown, I think everyone's itching to get out. This might be the first in-person conference for a lot of people. And uh, if you haven't registered yet for DEF CON, I highly recommend it. Uh, the staff at DEF CON is really going above and beyond to make sure that it's a safe environment for all attendees, uh, especially with, you know, the, the, um, uh, the latest developments. And so vaccinations will be required and so will mask for everybody at that conference. And so I think it'll be a pretty safe event. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, seeing old friends and making new ones. So we hope to see everybody at DEF CON this year. Yeah, no, I'm really excited for the event as well. So thank you guys so much for hopping on the call today. And thank you again for Bishop Fox being a sponsor. And we just really appreciate all the help. Thank you, Savannah. Thank you, Savannah. Appreciate thank it. You. Knock, knock, who's there, this guy? What's up, red teamers? What's up, DEF CON? It's your favorite fake brilliant billionaire investor. My little birdies, cheap, 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 cheap. I like cheap things, that's why I'm rich. They let me know that Lunar Fire is under fire, but that is a Tres Comas company. And that's got so much smart shit in it. And so it's unhackable. Or is it? No, it isn't. Not even you boy and girl geniuses can do it. You would have to be the human equivalents of cars with doors that open like this or like this. Are you? Can you? Will you? Don't. Hello everyone, I'm Barry Garnell from the Red Team Village, and today we are here with Omar Santos from the Red Team Village, as well as our guest Ipsect from Hack the Box. Hey guys, what's going on? Hello. Uh, Ipsect, uh, Hack the Box has been a longtime supporter of the Village. Uh, can you tell me more about the company? Yeah, um, Hack the Box is a hands-on security training platform, and our main goal is to make good training readily available to anyone in the world. If you're new to a topic or just the field in general. We have Hack the Box Academy, and it's a guided learning experience, which just means we have written material and hands-on labs. And again, when building this, accessibility was our number one desire. So we created the Pwn Box, which allows you to have a whole operating system in your browser, so the machine you're doing this learning on doesn't even have to be powerful. You can do it on like a Chromebook. If for some reason you want to do it on a phone, you can. I wouldn't recommend that. But everything's done within a web browser. If you want to bring your own OS, we also provide a VPN pack for you so you can join your OS to the VPN and go on learning. In addition to the academy, we have unguided learning, which is what we're most famous for. This is the weekly challenges machines or entire like networks we put out on the platform and that we ask people not to publicly talk about these challenges until they retire, which is typically 20 weeks. This is my favorite and what I credit most of my success to because it really enforces building good social relationships that not only help get you the help when you need it, but also when teaching, it often validates your understanding of it and it's proven to help memory retention. So I have a lot of friends from my in my social network that include Barry. I met him through another friend who met him at DerbyCon, which is a similar event of Red Team Village. And the funny thing is, both my other friend, Kyle and Barry, all lived within like 30 miles of each other, but we met like hundreds of miles away. So definitely like important to go view and travel and experience the community because you'll never know who you find and how close people may be. It's a small world. Absolutely. I think we've all been cooped up these last uh, few months here. I think a lot of people are excited to go in person to Las Vegas to attend DEF CON. And so we're really excited to see some of our old friends and, and make some new ones. Um, speaking of, of, of that community, you know, Hack the Box is a very vibrant community, both on their Discord as well as all over Twitter. Can you tell me a little bit more about the people behind Hack the Box, maybe some projects that you might be working on? Yeah, we have a innovation team that's designed at like pushing what we think is the limit. 
So typically most of our stuff is either a Docker or a VMware image. And the innovation team is looking into Google Cloud, AWS, and Azure to provide a pro lab called Black Sky, which is just based upon those types of features. So if you want to exploit IAM or do a lot of those unique cloud things, Black Sky Lab is going to be that. We also have, as you said, the Discord community. We have Roadrunner who runs that. And they help provide a lot of good support and just learning to anyone, in addition to a bunch of CTFs. I think we run the CTF like every other month or something. It's insane. Well, talking about the CTF and talking about all the activities, you know, throughout the years, you guys have supported the Red Team Village tremendously. So first of all, thank you and thank you, uh, Hack the Box. So uh, one of, I got a couple of questions, right? So one of the questions is, you know, what would you say that is the best part about sponsoring community efforts like the Red Team Village CTF this year? I mean, obviously it helps the community grow and most of my like, relationships. I can credit almost all my professional success as to leeching off my friend's knowledge because no one can know everything. And I can't speak for anyone at Hack the Box, but I know a bunch of my friends at Hack the Box are super excited to play a CTF built by other people. And we've played the Red Team Village CTS for quite a while. Um, I vaguely remember one, I think two years ago, that involved exploiting a printer, which was new to all of us. We we're all like big... Um, binary exploit people and then threw a different architecture at us that we never really experimented with. And it was just a lot of fun to play. So super excited to sponsor an event that we can participate in and learn new things to hopefully put out on our platform in the future. Thank you. Appreciate that. And I think that you're hitting my next question, which is why do you think sponsoring the, the Red Team Village this year is so important for the community? Yeah. Um, number one, it important to like with COVID and all we want to increase the socialization and everything we've been all cooped up and the red team village incorporates all of hack the boxes things the main thing was being accessible um, if you can't travel you can do it online and form a team and additionally if you want it's available for the high cost of zero dollars which aligns with kind of our methodology and what we want all our machines are available for free for a time. And then once they retire, then you have to pay a small fee to gain access to it because hosting 150 images permanently would just be expensive. Can't do that for free. Um, additionally, I believe InfoSec is a unique profession where team building activities have immeasurable impact. If you look at the non-InfoSec teams, they still do team building activities. Like you have that gimmicky trust fall and escape room, et cetera. And they're doing them just to help build that social bond between coworkers. So you know it's valuable since that's the only thing they care about. In the InfoSec world, we have CTFs that is just like that on steroids. It has all that same social bonding benefits. Like I mentioned earlier, I play CTS with Barry. I've played CTS with OXDF, Mr. Ben, John Hammond, a bunch of people. I just have a lot of fun with playing these CTFs along with coworkers. And in addition to that social bond that you build, it also gives you a lot of techniques that you may be able to immediately provide your work value because you're joining hands with a bunch of other companies to learn things. It wouldn't surprise me if you do the CTF and then find something that you can immediately turn around to do on your job. I remember doing almost any pro lab. I'll use Offra as an example where the foothold involves exploiting Splunk. And I had a pen test that I kept missing this vector on because I just didn't know it and Mr. Ben put it in that pro lab. So when I did that, it was just like an eye-opening thing of, oh God, what have I been missing? So definitely the big social aspect is huge here. Awesome. And and uh, I couldn't agree more. And, and, and once again, you know, thank you. I have one more last question. When it's around the benefits that your team actually will receive by participating at the, you know, DEF CON Red Team Village CTF this year. Yeah, um, Hack the Box and Red Team Village are almost synonymous in what we provide and our methodologies. So the only unfortunate thing is the Red Team Village CTF is a yearly thing, while Hack the Box produces new things on a weekly basis. It's probably not to the scale that Red Team Village will be doing just because it's constant. But if you're itching to do more after doing the CTF, definitely check out the platform if you haven't and go over to Hack the Box because I'm sure you'll love the challenges we put on the site. Awesome. So once again, thank you so much for supporting us. Thank you, Hack the Box, you know, for sponsoring the Red Team Village. And I hope to see you at DEF CON. Have yeah, take care. All right, we're back live. 
So um, with me, I have a few more guests. And um, Savannah, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass it back to you so you can introduce our guests. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Savannah. And today we have uh, Matthew Adelberg and also Milos and then Jean as well. So we're going to be doing a Red Team uh, interview today. We're going to be asking a few questions to them, uh, very casual. Uh, so I can go ahead and get started if everybody is ready. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, so I guess I'll start with Matt first and then I'll have uh, Milos and then Jean go next, kind of like answer the question to give some background. But I guess, how did you get started in your career, Matt? So I was a help desk analyst that was slowly trying to move up towards IT and everything like that. I had a bit of a background in security based from college. Um, and ironically, at the time when I was transitioning, uh, the company I work, was working for got hit with some ransomware. And because, you know, very few people had a bit of a background in that, I was kind of tasked and realized, you know, things are going on and just started doing mitigation and everything like that. And then it was like this layer effect of as we were pulling things apart, like we didn't have an IR procedure, anything like that, basic things. And I started having these conversations with people way, way above my pay grade that we need to have this stuff. And the kind of a thing was like, oh, you, you sound smart, but like you sound like you know what you're doing with this. So I started getting some support there. And then eventually, as I was learning more and more, um, I felt like, you know, the, you know, the policy based sort of things that I was used to reading out of a textbook in college wasn't really the thing I really liked, like, you know, the CTFs that we used to do and all the hands on stuff. So I really started getting into looking at pen testing. Now there was no there was no like free service back then. Everything was volume images or anything like that to really practice. So in my evenings and stuff, I was teaching myself real life practical cases using vul those vulnerable ISOs, uh, SQL injection or anything like that. And then eventually I got my off an offer to go work for the first pen testing firm, a consulting firm up here in Canada. And at that point, I just, you know, kind of went from there to meeting a bunch of people, local people where uh, we were all kind of focused on, you know, growing our skill trade and, you know, we all studied together. We eventually did the OSCP. And at that point, we just kept on going and going. That's how I got started as a very long winded way of going. That's awesome. I, I'll go ahead and pass it over to uh, Milos now. Sure. Thanks so much. And uh, hopefully folks can hear me. Okay. I'll apologize for, uh, for having to take this call uh, on, on, on the road, uh, unfortunately. So um, security for me was always kind of a passion. Um, I almost went into physics uh, and then I met with the head professor of physics at my local university um, who, who steered me into another, another career direction if I kind of wanted to look at something that was relatively profitable. But I really was kind of interested in security in my early teens. Kind of a lot of people, you know, I just missed the BBS era. So it was a lot of kind of like finding like websites, finding IRC servers, hanging out with people. Um, and I just kind of started building out my knowledge set that way. Uh, I ended up doing an undergrad in information security as well, um, which I did here uh, locally in Canada, which was really good to reinforce skill set capabilities um, and to kind of put myself on the map and started working kind of full time in the industry as a uh, as I was still finishing my undergrad and uh, the rest is history, just kind of getting more and more into the security space, always had a passion for offense. Um, here we are today. Gene, do you want to go ahead and uh, answer yeah, the sure. question as well? Sure. So uh, it all started for me, basically, when I was uh, leaving school, I got hired in a Belgian service provider. And I started out as a system engineer. So yeah, basically, I, I did networking stuff. But uh, my my primary duty basically was was accepting tickets, so it was also like kind of a service desk role, but I got uh, quite tedious for me, and there was a lot of repetition as well, which I um, started noticing as time went on. So I started automating a lot of stuff in my job because, well, it, you see the same things coming over and over again, and you start making them automatically, so you do save a lot of time, which gave me two options, either uh, do nothing all day, get paid and, and be happy and just move on with my life or level up my own skills. And that's what I did. So I already had that system engineering background and I started learning about uh, pen testing and network attacks. And then basically I got hired by a consulting firm here in Belgium called Inviso. 
uh, and because I was already a system engineer and had that networking experience, it kind of makes sense for me to to do the network infrastructure engagements um, based on on my experience. So I started as a as a network pen tester basically, so I could blast Bloodhound and just scan networks for for exploits and, and start poning stuff. But then as time went on and customers got more and more mature, I started going and transitioning into red teaming and purple teaming as well. So that's <laughs> how it went for me. That's awesome. Uh, and then I guess it would be also helpful to have each of you guys introduce yourself. So I'm sorry for skipping that question. <laughs> um, I'll have Matt go ahead and introduce yourself and then Milos and then Jean next to kind of give everyone an idea of where you guys are at now versus how you kind of got started. Sure. So uh, my name is Matthew Edelberg. I am a technical manager at Optiv. Uh, my primary role is leading our red and purple team under the advisory services. Uh, in this role, I, you know, not only just leading and executing on projects, but also innovating and in research. Uh, and that is a big part of the role, but also the culture that I try to kind of instill is to not just uh, do these crazy gigs, but also kind of give back to communities, articling, research, anything like that. Um, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Milos now to uh, introduce himself. Hey folks, uh, my name is Milos Stadinovich. Um, I am currently the senior director of adversary emulation threat hunting and a dedicated digital development team at the Royal Bank of Canada. So responsible for red team, um, our threat hunting team, as well as a digital development team that develops custom solutions for our cyber analytics team, which is largely grounded in machine learning and data science, as well as our threat hunting and adversary emulation team. So, yeah, so my name is Jean-Francois. Um, yeah, basically, I'm the technical red team lead at Inviso, which means that I'm not doing the business side of things, but I'm more of the guy that does the, the malware development and do the buy versus build kind of thing to, to figure out whether or not we should buy tools or build tools ourselves. Uh, so yeah, I, I lead red teams uh, from a technical point of view. And I'm also a SANS instructor, so I also teach a SANS course uh, 699, which is the purple teaming one. Uh, so yeah, that's a bit about me. Yeah, no, those are awesome jobs. Uh, the next question that I have for you guys is to kind of see what kind of tools you guys like the most in your tool set. So what are your go-to go tools on any engagements you guys are doing or anything along those lines? I'll pass sure. it to Matt. Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, so I, as much as I like to say I have a tool set and stuff, I really do try to keep a mindset of, you know, there's no such thing as a one tool that fits every, you know, solution. Uh, every time you go up against any type of environment or, or situation, you're always going to have to be very fluid. Uh, so the ones that, with that in that mind, the ones that I normally go to, you know, obviously, I'm a, for command and control, I'm a huge uh, Cobalt Strike um, user, as well as you know, a lot of the open source tools I've developed, such as Scarecrow um, and a few others. From that type of perspective of going back around, the ones I'd say I commonly use, uh, anything where between something like uh, a, a version of Safety Cats or something that dumps uh, LSAS, like Sharp Dump, um, ranging towards some more stuff about, you know, uh, recon, uh, such as tools like, you know, Bloodhound is great, uh, Vibe, if you're not familiar with that one. Um, uh, personally my favorite when it comes down to domain reconnaissance um but once again like, like i said i really am someone that believes that customization is the best thing to do it so i'll often take some tools down and kind of remodify them and change them up so they're very different um just for a high level success and everything like that so uh, you know i might take some standard tools or you know the latest um t uh, techniques or ttps that have come out i'll try to modify them so they really are different than what everyone else is using i hope i mean and that didn't really answer the question but that's just my personal belief around tooling yeah I, i'm gonna echo a lot of the same of what matthew's saying uh there's definitely like staple tools that i think any kind of offensive team will probably leverage but the tools that you leverage and the tactics and the techniques and procedures are informed by um the situation that you're in, right? So what's the environment that you're targeting? What kind of trade craft does it warrant for utilization? So, I mean, yeah, from a C2 perspective on Windows side, uh, Cobalt Strike is, is a pretty standard staple for, for a lot of folks. Um, over on Mac and Linux, you've got kind of some other open source options that you can do custom development on top of. Um, outside of that, it is a lot of really kind of adapting to, to the environment that you're targeting and developing custom tooling to 
evade modern tech stacks or modern security controls, um, depending upon what crosses your path, right? So if you're navigating an organization that uses one or multiple EDRs, uh, maybe you're looking at techniques to get into kernel mode, load your own drivers, you know, kill some, some kernel callbacks that are happening. Um, it really just kind of depends on what you see uh, ahead of you. And of course, there's always the notion of kind of tempering tradecraft to the defensive team um, that you were going up against as well. Um, Ideally, red teaming should be a process of, of kind of sparring between offensive and defense and not necessarily um, just a process of sort of red team kind of coming through like a steamroller um, and targeting targeting uh, objectives with, with kind of leaving the blue team entirely behind. So I would say tradecraft depends on what you're trying to do and also the, the level of capability for the existing blue team in the organization that you're working with. Yeah, I think from my side, I very much resonate with what uh, what has already been said, right? It all depends on the organization you're facing. Uh, if you're facing a mature client, you're probably not wanting to blast bloodhounds uh, all over the place because that will probably get you caught. Uh, so it really all depends on, on your maturity level and what you're facing. Uh, I do hear Cobalt Strikes uh, <laughs> being mentioned a lot. It's exactly the same for me. Uh, we, we use Cobalt Strike as well, just because a lot of adversaries, like real life adversaries use it. So it makes sense that we kind of emulate that. But we also look into some more uh, quote unquote obscure <laughs> C2 frameworks uh, that are not that well known yet, such as, for example, uh, Brute Rato from Paranoid Ninja. And I heard that MDSEC is probably on the verge of launching their, uh, their own C2 uh, implant as well. So we're probably going to start looking into that when that releases, just to see what it's all about. Uh, and yeah, it's very much as, as, as already been mentioned, it's about modifying the already existing tooling out there. You don't necessarily have to reinvent the wheel. If you just know your way a bit around obfuscation and just replacing certain strings, you can break a lot of detections already. So yeah, uh, it comes down to what you're facing and it comes down to your own skills as well, whether or not you're able to create your own tooling, uh, how much time you have, and yeah, whether or not you can obfuscate or just stringly brace basically uh, stuff to, to just break signatures. That's awesome. And I know, Jean, that you said that you have a workshop coming up in just a few minutes, so I know you have to drop yeah, early. Correct. So mm -hmm. do you want to go ahead and kind of tell everyone about the workshop before you do have to drop and so we can kind yeah, of Yeah, sure. sure. So uh, I'll, be, I'll be doing a, a live workshop at the, the Adversary Emulation Village. So it's uh, like the, the, friend, the friendly village that is just uh, nearby. So I'll be doing a, a live workshop there about C Sharp, basically. Uh, it's a very accessible workshop. So I tried to make it as accessible as possible. So even if you have never played around with C Sharp before, you should probably be able to at least understand what the, what's going on there. Uh, it's also it also has its own workbook where you can do some exercises as well. And it's about reflection basically. So we're leveraging the uh, DC Sharp or the .NET frameworks built-in reflection capabilities to create some loaders and basically expand upon them. Uh, so we start with a very very simple one that is just loading another C Sharp assembly from disk, and then we expand that to also be able to fetch it from the internet, do some uh, Amzian ETW bypasses and all that good stuff. Wow, that's that's awesome. I'd recommend anyone who's watching right now, definitely go to that workshop. Definitely get some good information out of that uh, with C Sharp. Uh, with C Sharp, sorry. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I'll let Jean, if you need to drop, you're yeah. welcome to drop I will, be, uh, I will be dropping now, so uh, thanks Thank for having so me. Thank you so much for coming <laughs> on today as well. See you around, bye. Bye. Uh, so. Uh, Milos and Matt, the next question I have for you guys is kind of what do you recommend for anyone who's interested? And in, I know obviously like you can't just like jump into red teaming, but if somebody wanted to kind of go towards that path, what would you recommend for them to kind of get started and what should they do to kind of work towards up to that path? So I'll pass it to Matt first. Sure. So um, I would say, um, and I, I, I think it's pretty much the best way to describe the difference first uh, between pen testing and red teaming. You know, pen testing is you're pulling every trick out of trade and kind of throwing it at the wall and seeing what sticks. Whereas with red teaming, it's more of a surgical knife cutting through, um, and it's very focused on stealth. So, um, trying to get into pen testing, I would say the first thing you got to learn is the core found foundations, understanding, having a good solid background in the you know Active Directory, Windows environments, um, is pretty much a critical. I would say scripting next. Um, different languages can be very useful, uh, but 
really having those as a big foundation. And as you transition, as you kind of mentioned from, you know, it's not just, a, you know, a direct beeline to red teaming, but as you go down that path, you'll start to get really passionate about things and also trying to improve your trade craft. Uh, one of the, the biggest things when people ask me about red teaming is, is that, you know, if you're a solid pen tester for X amount of years, the next step is challenge yourself. Take your same techniques, the same way you're executing things, but see how you can improve upon them. Uh, we kind of mentioned a lot here about customization and you know removing strings and stuff. But taking the challenge to say that I want to rebuild. You know, if I rely on say tool X a lot and it does something, well, what are the artifacts or something like that? How can I improve on it so that way I'm more evasive? How, that I'm not. I'm being more. I'm still having that same high level of success, but now. I'm focusing not just on that success vector, but on that invisibility vector. And when you start adding those two, it's almost a blended approach. You get this very, very strong background and you start to learn and it just kind of opens up doors and knowledge um, that kind of just springboards you. Once you start down that path, it, you kind of go into a, a different whole other gear. It's the best way I can describe what to recommend is just constantly learn and try to improve on your trade craft, starting with the fundamentals and then adding on complexity. Yeah, so I think I think from my perspective, I'd echo a lot of the same. I mean, there, there's a couple of factors, right? So if you're kind of already in security, um, then maybe maybe your your road to moving towards red team or towards the offensive space would be a little bit different. But I would say if you're someone who isn't in security at all and you're looking to kind of reach into that environment, I think DEF CON has a lot of really good local communities um, where you can start bridging connections with people who are in the industry. A lot of fairly large cities have their own sort of user groups or interest groups that are focused on security and you can kind of start getting your feet wet. Um, outside of that, there's plenty of free online material that you can learn from um, to give you some sort of basis and understanding like um, to, to really just calibrate your compass and set your bearings in terms of what direction you want to go in or, or to learn for cybersecurity. Um, if you're if you're already in offense and, or you're in cybersecurity and you want to kind of move into the direction of, of red teaming, um, it, it's kind of an interesting question. I mean, I think it's a certain certain skill sets within red teaming are conducive to bringing someone in who, who doesn't necessarily have an offensive background and kind of allowing them to run with it and they can develop that capability um, over time. So we've had good success bringing in, for example, really savvy low-level developers into our red team uh, and turning them into kind of um, our, our, our R&D backbone for developing custom implants, loaders, malware, whatever it may be. Um, and then at the same time, upskilling them with red team skill sets and better understanding of target environments that they might come across. Invariably, the two need to intersect. I think most people um, who, who are in red teaming and have kind of been in this field or, or doing this type of offensive security for some time have done your typical kind of you know vulnerability assessment to penetration testing to penetration testing with social engineering to then eventually doing something called called uh, red teaming. And, you know, while the trade craft may be similar, the goals, objectives, and purpose of those two exercises are, are entirely different and they don't necessarily intersect um, as much as people might think. But uh, I think that the past really kind of depends on, on where someone's starting from. Um, in terms of bettering yourself and, and preparing yourself to become a more effective red teamer, it is really about this, this, this ability to assimilate information quickly um, and then adapt to unexpected obstacles. Right? So Matthew talks about this notion of like upskilling your tradecraft. Like, there are staple tools that we use, but you know, peel those covers back, start to understand how they operate. Um, when you begin to understand the fundamentals of you know, operating systems that most red teamers are targeting these days, it really starts to level set your horizon and allows you to better understand where is the current trade craft developed, where are things focusing, why are they focusing in that direction? Um, and that really kind of allows you to get a better idea of where things may go in the future and also to better understand, you know, what, what kind of IOCs um, or indicators does your trade craft leave behind, really allowing you to be more comprehensive from both offensive and, 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 and detection or detective perspective. So uh, I, I know it's not really an answer to the question because it's a difficult question to answer. I would say it depends where you're starting from. Um, but if you're starting from ground zero, you don't have, you're not in this industry at all. Um, you you want to kind of start to meet some people. Almost every major town has a Discord server or a Slack chat or a local meetup that happens where you can kind of start building your connections. Twitter's another good place to start getting some decent information. You gotta weed through, through, through a little bit of uh, unnecessary data, but um, it is a good place to get some good, some good information. And then if you're in the industry, um, it's really just about you know constantly pushing and learning and, and going deeper and understanding more and more fundamentals around the operating systems that you're targeting, how they function. 
function? Why do they function that way? Um, and, uh, and and that in and of itself will bring ideas to you in terms of future trade craft development, like better understanding trade craft, uh, and seeing where things go. So, yeah. um, So both of you guys, what you just kind of went through, I think that was honestly like really good information for anyone who's watching to kind of like take away, because uh, you can't stress enough that you can't just kind of like jump into red teaming or pen testing. You kind of have to build and have a foundation and kind of build your way up to that kind of path. Uh, it's not just something that you just jump right into. So both Milos and Matt's advice is definitely good advice to kind of take from. Um, so we're kind of wrapping up with the questions now, and I just kind of wanted to ask Milos and Matt if there's anything else that you guys kind of wanted to bring up before we end the interview. Um, we do appreciate having you guys on, so I'll kind of pass it back to see if you guys have anything else that you want to mention. Um, I mean, you want to go first, Milos? Uh, I'm going to do sort of like a no necessarily offense-related PSA, but if you're new to this industry, um, don't burn yourself out too fast. Uh, it, it's a really easy, it, it, there's a lot of, I'm going to be quite direct, maybe this might not be a very good point. People might not like this, but there's a lot of toxicity in this industry. And there's a lot of kind of this notion of like, you know, if you're not doing cybersecurity 24 hours a day, I mean, then, you, know, you can't succeed in this industry. And, and I don't think that's true. I made that mistake actually. I, you know, did the whole labor, like, what creates cybersecurity? You know, 24 hours a day, go to work, do research for eight hours a day, pass it out, do it again for the better part of a decade. And honestly, I can tell you how I got to the end of it. There's a lot more important stuff to life, right? And, and there's a lot of other things that you can enjoy and hobbies that you can have. So, you know, don't don't let kind of this industry sort of eat you up and, and spit you out in this notion of like it has to clear it. You can be very passionate about it. I certainly am. I know Matthew as well. Uh, but you still got to have time for life, right? So, like, still be a person and still do other things that you enjoy that are probably not computer related at all, right? Um, just to kind of keep your sanity and to, to say, I know it's not really kind of maybe in the same vein, but I think it's an important topic to mention for people that are coming new in, into this industry because it, it, it can be a little bit daunting. Yeah, and just to echo that, um, I, I will say definitely I'm a big believer in research, and as I've you know been mentioning a lot about is tradecraft, but you have to keep that in a bubble and keep your life in that equal bubble as you're moving forward. Don't look over and see, oh my God, look at what everyone else is publishing, all this crazy stuff. I got to better myself. I got to push myself three times harder. No, don't don't look at it like that. You should look at it as like look at what the great stuff coming out of this community, and I'm contributing. Uh, I see a lot of people who are starting out who are great honestly brilliant researchers who do amazing stuff but they get so burnt out or they get so upset that they don't even ever publish their own content because they're afraid of what happens when it comes out just do it for yourself like this industry is hugely about sharing open source in the community if you know, anything like as Milos kind of mentioned discord twitter everything like that uh i know that there has been some kind of things that you know as you kind of mentioned but where i would say that is do it for yourself and at the end of the day, make sure you know that, okay, I'm stepping away. I'm going to go do something else. Work-life balance is very important. Um, and I mean, I, even myself, you know, 18 hour work days where you know, I finish work and I just start researching. I'm very passionate about developing and research. A lot of people who know me know that's pretty much true. I, you know, live and breathe the monitor of security and stuff. But like recently, if I can say one bit of advice, you know, more than technological advice, if you walk out of here, is balance your life. There's always going to be a new exploit. There's always going to be something new. But your family is the one thing that should be always in the forefront as the most important thing or your personal health. So, I mean, I guess that wasn't pro probably the answer you were expecting from both of us, but I think that's the most important thing I can pass on to anyone that's new, starting out in this industry or anything like that is don't don't look at everyone else's work. Focus on yourself and know when it's time to go walk away from the computer and you know have other things important in your life. I gotta, I gotta, can I add one more, one more thing yeah. that, that I think is worth mentioning as well? Um, you may find that like if you're coming into this industry, it's certainly valuable to have someone that can mentor you. If, if you kind of have the ability to have someone that can do that. You may also find that this industry is very much so like, well, you need to learn things on your own and you no know, one helps each other, right? Especially in the offensive space, I noticed this to be like a consistent trend. There is help, but there isn't kind of like as much typical mentorship as you might see in other areas. So I would just say like, look, 
if you want help, right, reach out to people. And if and if a couple people snub you, don't 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 beat yourself up about it. Like some some people are going to be jerks in any industry, right? They don't want to help people. They want to put themselves on a pedestal. So just move on to the next person, right? Like the world is big enough. There's enough people working in this industry now that you're you'll eventually come across someone who's a decent human being who's willing to help you out, who's willing to give you some pointers and, and lead you in a direction. Everyone was always there, right? No one was born knowing all of this stuff on day one. So everyone's kind of gone down at least a very similar path, not the same way. Couldn't agree more. Yeah, I was. I mean, I'm gonna say like that was awesome advice. I don't think that that was bad advice at all because Matt stresses to me all the time, like Savannah, like don't burn yourself out. I'm like, okay, Matt, but like the advice is truly really important because once you burn yourself out, it's really hard to kind of like bounce back. Um, so I mean, I just want to thank both you, Matt and uh, Milos, for coming on today and kind of giving some advice to people that are watching. And we look forward to having you guys in the future. And if you want to mention your handles for anyone to follow you or to reach out or anything, feel free to do that now. But we're going to go ahead and kind of wrap things up. Sure. So um, my handle is right now right beside my, on my message. But the one thing I'll maybe mention is, much like Jean, I am doing a talk today at 115 PDT at the Adversarial uh, Village. Check it out. It's all about uh, tradecraft and adversarial bypassing of EDRs for payloads. The title of the talk is Operation Bypass catch my payload if you can. If you're interested in anything along that line, I think, you know, there's, it'll be a lot of great stuff and there's going to be some releases attached to that. So definitely check it out if you're interested in this type of stuff. Uh, I'm, I'm good on my end. I don't generally associate my, my online handles with my actual person. So um, I'll see you around, I guess. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Thank you guys so much for joining today. We're going to go ahead and cut to a break now. Awesome. Thank you. We're going on a break real quick. And um, before we go into the break, let me share the, the statistics right now on the the scoreboard. AI generated still in the first place. EPT is the second and Neutrino Cannon actually moved from fourth to third. And if you don't know what we're talking about, of course, you know, the qualifiers part two are now live. Uh, you can see the scoreboard at the link that I'm showing at the bottom of the screen. And you can also see the schedule of all the interviews and all the panels that were yeah, they're taking place today in the bottom of the screen as well so with that thank you again guys i really appreciate it and we're going to break thanks again thank
Knock, knock, who's there? This guy. What's up, red teamers? What's up, DEFCON? It's your favorite fake, brilliant billionaire investor. My little birdies, cheap, 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 cheap. I like cheap things. That's why I'm rich. They let me know that Lunar Fire is under fire. But that is a Tres Comas company. And that's got so much smart shit in it. And so it's unhackable. Or is it? No, it isn't. Not even you boy and girl geniuses can do it. You would have to be the human equivalents of cars with doors that open like this or like this. Are you? Can you? Will you? Don't. All right, we're back. And uh, just going back to the, the Art CTF Quals uh, scoreboard, in first place, we still have AI generated. And second, EPT and actually Neutrino Cannon just went down to fourth. So Hacktree's boys just took the lead, but not by much. Now, with that said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass it back to Barrett, even though he's not in the camera. I'm going to let him introduce our next guest and take it away. All right, everyone. Uh, we have an exciting interview next. We've got three people that I think most folks on the stream are familiar with, uh, with their tools and some of the work that they've done. I'll let them introduce themselves, starting with you, Matt. Cool, how's it going? I'm Matthew Bryan, or my handle's mandatory online. Um, I currently lead the red team at Snap and write a lot of uh, tooling in my spare time, stuff like that, so. Hey, I'm Nero. Um, I'm like a tech lead manager on the Google red team. So I lead, manage, and work on red team exercises and help the program as well. My name's Jared Macy. I'm the red team lead at Bishop Fox, uh, which is a consulting firm. Uh, we do a variety of uh, security testing, but uh, recently, yeah, I, I lead the red team and we do uh, basically the full gambit of uh, red team operations. So. Thank you so much for taking some time out of DEF CON. I know there's a lot to pack in. Uh, for our stream, especially with a lot of our viewers, people who are part of the village, uh, we love to provide a lot of advice for folks that are building their offensive uh, security skills. And especially as they're kind of elevating through that, a lot of folks have aspirations of being on a red team. And so I'd like to start off just, just by asking each of you, uh, how'd you get started in this career? Yeah, so I guess my start was definitely um, probably, I mean, the start to start was probably just me, you know, taking a lot of my personal time to sort of read about like all the security stuff online, uh, lots and lots of like blog posts and, you know, random books that I could find. Um, but I think it probably one of the biggest, um, in terms of knowledge shift, it was like probably being a consultant, actually at Bishop yeah. Fox. Uh, yeah. Just and just taking like every time anybody said anything I didn't know, I'd like write it down and go and cram it. Um, and so that really, really upped the amount I was able to know and understand. Um, and then, you know, after that, ended up doing like private security stuff and sort of moved more into like the red teaming side of things. So we hired him off of Reddit, like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Nice. real transition. So yeah. <laughs> you want to go next, Joe? Yeah. yeah. Um, I've always, so I've always been into computers in general. Uh, I grew up like going to LAN parties. Um, and my parents like never allowed me to have an internet connection at home. So I actually got into security uh, through like building Wi-Fi antennas to steal my neighbor's like internet connection so I could play video games online uh, at home. And then it kind of, it, it really snowballed from there. Um, I started getting into programming and uh, yeah, the rest is kind of history. But, so. Um, I guess I kind of stumbled into security and like both of them, they kind of started security early for me. It was more like I just stumbled into it. Um, I graduated from undergrad doing computer science and I was hired into a role to do testing. And then on the first day of my internship, I find out that it's more security than testing. Um, so just like start from there, did the application plan testing, really enjoyed it. Uh, back then the term red team was new to me and I wanted to get into it, but I didn't really understand what it was. Uh, did my master's in security, uh, tried consulting for a bit and then entered into Google, did a lot of like assessment oriented reviews, like design reviews, code reviews and stuff. And then um, started working on red team exercises alongside really smart people and just picked it up from there. Uh, but yeah, kind of stumbled into it and things worked out as I started like working towards it. I think that's, that's one of the cool things about uh, like the secure InfoSec as it exists today is there's a very wide variety of backgrounds. Like you have a master's degree, uh, Matt and I dropped out of college. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but it's, you know, you know, there's no like one background that people really come from uh, into the industry. It's, it's really open to an, anybody's background. Like uh, at our firm, like we had somebody who's like a medical doctor and just like got bored with medicine and came and became like a hacker. Uh, for a little while. So, um, yeah, it's, it's 
one of the very unique things I think about security right now. So absolutely you don't have to have a pedigree to to get here. Yeah. That's great. Just a passion. That's Speaking great. of which, great segue. Uh, you know, what makes you really passionate about what you're doing right now? Yeah, so I I mean I think the biggest thing is just like it's always like completely new challenges and like mm -hmm. the problem space is like never like um like you always come in with like previous experiences of just like in the sense that you've, you've hacked a bunch of stuff before, but like oftentimes you just be handed a completely new system that may be written completely in house. You have no, no, don't know anything about it. And you have to like, just be like, all right, today I'm going to like learn this thing and like figure it out. So it's like never boring and like boring is always what I just like the most. So I think it's probably my favorite part about it. Yeah. It's like solving puzzles. Like every day someone gives you something new. Um, it's also one thing that people don't talk about often is like you bang your head against a problem for a long, long time. And then finally it, it like gives way. Um, it's both the most satisfying feeling when it gives way, but it's also like frustrating to get there. But, uh, the journey of like figuring out how something works, taking it apart, uh, finding the fastest way to get to what you need. I think that keeps things new every single day. Yeah, I think the, I'm I'm in a similar boat. So, and I think there's there's a slight difference between uh, like being on an internal red team versus a consulting red team. Um, you know, we being a consultancy, we work for a variety of different clients in different industries. There's always a different tech stack. Uh, you know, you might be hacking, you know, uh, some type of uh, manufacturing facility one week, and a couple of weeks later, you'll be, uh, you know, going after something, you know, some tech company or something. And so, you know, one, and one will have like a Windows domain and the other, will, there's no Windows machines, it's all MacBooks uh, or like Chromebooks or something. And so just the, the in consulting, you just get this like really fun variety. Um, and you kind of, you kind of get exposed to just, just everything from, you know, systems that have been laying around for 10 years to things that are sort of in the hit, you know, serverless like application stacks and, and uh, more sort of hipster tech so I like to call it. Uh, so. I think it's also the capabilities of the blue teams will probably vary a lot. Right? Yeah, as well as like how you approach like detection in, in mm -hmm. environments. And, for, and from a red team perspective, the way you approach, you know, persistence varies significantly as well. In sort of the beyond corp, zero corp uh, environments, you don't even necessarily need like code running on machines. Like when people think about persistence, they think about code running on machines somewhere. But in in the, the sort of the beyond corp world, it's more about like credentials because you, the attacker, you as the attacker, always have access to like the authentication plane, um, and it can be oftentimes much more difficult to revoke credentials versus like killing a process on a machine. So one of the things we try to do in, is you know try to vary our approaches to different um, you know TTPs depending on the, the target environment. We always try to sort of uh, push the boundaries in, in those different environments. So. That's a good example of just like the fact that nothing's ever the same between yeah. like different stuff. Like you, even something that you would always take for granted, where it's just like, okay, well, at least in every engagement, like I'm gonna have like you know an implant or something. It's gonna be like a first compromise and then some in some network. But then there's like yeah, there's stuff like this where it's like, oh, actually, none of that is you know mm -hmm. applies in this one. You have to completely rethink how you do it. So, I think and and Matt's presentation which she's giving later <laughs> today, I think is a really good example of some of this stuff. I don't know if you wanna. Yeah, please, yeah. Please give do. a quick pitch for that, but uh, please do. Yeah, yeah. So I'm doing a, a talk later today at DefCon. Um, these the the pre-recorded video actually is already online. The slides are, but it's you know about you know G Suite, uh, Google Workspace, um, and App Script, and sort of the security model behind these things. And you know, it talks about um, some really interesting topics, like you can make an implant in App Script and have it be completely you know separate from your device. You know, you can have an implant that persists past wiping your laptop, all sorts of stuff like this. So it really delves into this sort of weirder world where it's like, okay, well. You know, we have a, a a company that really takes us to heart, the zero trust sort of thing. How can we still survive and like, you know, get access and you know, do lateral movement and stuff like that? One of the other things I really liked was like, it's not necessarily about exploiting vulnerabilities so much as like design flaws and like misconceptions about how things are kind of supposed to work. Yeah. Um, and that's one thing that I I think I find often on on red teams is like. Mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily exploiting vulnerabilities, but misconceptions about how certain pieces of technology work often uh, bears very good fruit uh, for the red team. So, yeah, yeah. that's very good. Yeah, I think that's kind of a distinction that red team has between pen testing and red teaming. Is like you're not trying to find all the bugs; you're trying to find the fastest way to get to something. And it, you don't actually just look at the systems; you look at the people and processes that support the systems as well. 
And a lot of times the processes or the people kind of give way before the systems themselves. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. yeah. So with such a, a dynamic environment, um, you know, I think there's no end to the amount of tools and the amount of uh, platforms you can study, the different technologies. What are some of the tool sets that, that the three of you uh, uh, like to use? Um, I can probably give a plug to theirs um, <laughs> because like, we use a bunch of open source tools as well. And we've used Sliver, uh, Joe's yes. C2 implant stuff, as well as Curse Chrome, which is like the Chrome extension yeah. implant. Mm -hmm. so. We used to, yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm the co-author of an uh, open source a C2 framework called Sliver. Uh, we use that pretty extensively internally. We have some internal sort of extensions on top of it, but I also am a, a, a user of the Cursed Chrome extension that Matt wrote. Uh, we use that pretty extensively. Again, in sort of like these beyond corp situations, it's particularly good for getting around U2F, which is becoming, which is a really difficult security control to get around, and I see it becoming more and more popular. Because uh, it kind of takes like credential phishing off the table and password spraying and some of these like very effective uh, sort of low risk from detection at, uh, early on in an engagement uh, approaches to getting initial access. So, but yeah, we use Curse Chrome quite a bit um, as well as like some of the techniques you developed for uh, injecting it into the runtime of existing mm -hmm. extensions. Uh, we wrote some some stuff around that as well. Uh, but yeah, Sliver is sort of our go-to if we want native code running on a machine. Uh, it's cross-platform, runs on Mac OS, Windows, uh, Linux, as well as like FreeBSD. Uh, and basically anything Go can cross-compile to, Sliver can probably run on in some capacity. You know, there's certain features that are platform specific, uh, but uh, yeah, we, we use it quite a bit, so. Yeah, we use Sliver as well, super useful, especially for the, the cross-compile thing is very useful because trying to find something that works on like, you know, OS X and like has yeah. like reasonable functionality. It's like not as easy as it sounds, so. Um, yeah, actually, uh, in addition to like all the open source projects, uh, a lot of things that I find I use is um, actually just like when people do research or they write up blog posts and they kind of describe like different attacks, um, like that actually is something that I use quite a bit. Like there's, um, like I, I remember doing some you know, research into like, okay, well, like how can we exploit the OSX platform? What does that look like? And just reading like blog posts that even just broke down existing malware and like tricks that they used and like stuff like new attacks that people discussed um, that uh, well, not directly like code. It was like taking those snippets and like working those and using them as a starting point to build you know, mm -hmm. our own payload. That's something that I use quite a bit as well. So yeah, yeah, I think that's uh, in my experience uh, training sort of junior red teamers. That's often like the steepest learning curve is sort of being able. You know, in pen testing, you deal a lot with like proofs of concept. And I, I was in application security before sort of switching to red teaming. Um, and there, you know, it's it's generally enough to kind of just do a POC. Sometimes you, you'll you know you'll add some flavor and and like. Uh, you know, to, to show, show impact. But I think one of the uh, learning curves that people experience when coming over to red teaming is you actually have to like weaponize this stuff and deploy it and actually get it all to work. And you need it to work like fairly reliably in, a, in an environment that you don't necessarily have, like it's, it, it's generally not realistic to have a perfect lab environment that you're uh, for your target. So you have to do like a lot of guesswork. Uh, you have to have a lot of contingencies uh, and you have to bake that into your code, into your payloads, uh, into your operating procedures, like into everything. So, um, as well as just being able to take those POCs, because oftentimes you'll you'll do some research on a target, you'll find like a POC that was published, but you know it won't work, and it's you know it's a little broken or it doesn't work in the way that you need it to, and so you'll have to take that and modify it and integrate it into your existing tools. And so that's, that's an extremely valuable skill set. And I think it's uh, it's one that juniors have a hard time acquiring sometimes. So. Yeah, I will say that I think that um, one, of the, one of the things that I really encourage people to get in the habit of is even if you're in AppSec and you're not doing red teaming, like taking the time to write proof of concepts, like the full thing, uh, it, it's not just like, even if it's, yeah, it's proof of concept that's not actually gonna get used, um, just like weaponize a cross-site scripting vulnerability. Uh, it'll take your understanding of what's going on from like, oh, cool, I made an alert box happen, yeah. something, uh, to like, oh, I, I, like, I understand all the things I can actually do with this and like the real danger. And so when people ask you things like, what's the impact, you are like, can authoritatively speak, right? So, yeah, I, I banned alert boxes for cross site scripting examples at Bishop Box. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you have to write a real payload. <laughs> This, uh, this is a question that uh, I think a lot of folks interpret differently in terms of like their answer, but, uh, but there's a lot of misnomers out there and in our industry, we're always trying to get to a common language. How would you define, you know, like what is a red team or a red team? Or what, what makes that unique from other types of, uh, of uh, titles? So 
we would say like red teaming is where you're simulating an adversary. Uh, so you're trying mm -hmm. to copy their actual TTPs. You're trying to work towards an objective mm -hmm. and you're trying to show how they would get to that objective and how they would achieve their goals. So it's very catered around one, who are you simulating? What is the attacker profile you picked? What are the objectives you're trying to achieve and how do you get there? So it's not so much as like find every issue in a system. It's like mm -hmm. get to that point the fastest way possible in a way that it makes sense for that attacker profile that you picked. Um, so that is the main distinction, I would say, between a red team and between like a pen test or an assessment. That's great. Yeah, the, the way I think about it is, you know, it's all offensive security testing. So like there's a lot of overlap. But to me, the primary distinctions are, you know, a pen test is real is generally you're trying to find uh, as many vulnerabilities as possible in a, in a target in, within, within a certain time frame. Stealth is usually not a concern. Yeah. And the primary objective of a pen test is to uh, reduce the attack surface of the target, whether that's a network or an application. A red team is more goal oriented and you're generally actually trying to use the fewest number of vulnerabilities to achieve a goal because that will more or less translate into your exposure to detection. Like if you find one way to get domain admin on a red team, you're probably not going to go back and try to find another path to domain admin, but you probably would do that in a pen test, right? Because in a pen test, again, you're trying to reduce attack surface. You want to find as much stuff as possible. Red team is just like, can a goal be achieved? And often you're trying to emulate specific adversaries because the outcome that you want from a red team is to sort of, uh, increase the organization's detection and response capabilities or to exercise them. You know, a lot of organizations uh, have, you know, procedures and stuff written down on paper, but if you never exercise those, you know, you, you may you may run into problems. Uh, so, um, for, you know, you really want uh, muscle memory when it comes to responding to incidences, and the red team can sort of help build that muscle memory within an organization uh, versus, again, like, a, and red teams sort of are generally more broadly scoped. It's about people, uh, you know, social engineering is often involved. It's not necessarily just about technical vulnerabilities. And a pen test is generally always focused on uh, technical vulnerabilities. So, yeah, I think they describe like the meat of it. Um, I, I think like the one thing that for people who are you know very very good on the just like the hacking side of things, the people who are like well, but exploit really easily, you know, they know all that. The biggest thing that I think for them that for me to like basically convey to them is like you know I'm always phrasing stuff as in like okay, I am the person we're emulating. My thought, you know, my bosses don't care if I find ten exploits in this thing. My, they only care <laughs> if I get the data I'm looking for and I give it back, right? Like. Um, or if it's like I'm a disgruntled employee or whatever the you know whatever I'm simulating, it's like I'm trying to I'm trying to put myself in that person's shoes and say what do, what would I actually do here, right? Like not like what I do something as crazy as like what we're pulling off. Does that make sense? Like because it, you know you can always do crazy attacks, but when you're you're really trying to emulate like what you know what, what Joe mentioned, like the detection response side of things, you want to make sure you're you're actually doing a, a real simulation that's helpful there. So. And to add to that, like it's about adding value. Is it like you're actually testing the controls in place? You're testing the detection and response capabilities. Be it what can they actually see in terms of like detection signals, but also what do they do once they see it? To yeah. Joe's point, so the value added is more for the organization that kind of has some security capabilities already. So if it is an organization that's newer in terms of security, building on security, red teaming is a little bit like jumping the gun. In some ways. Yeah, we, we certainly see a lot of that in consulting. And usually what I'll tell clients is like, if you haven't done a lot of pen tests, you definitely don't want a red team. Like you kind of want to start with pen tests and work your way up towards uh, red team as you mature your security program uh, within the, the organization. So Yeah, you can often, I especially find that you can run into situations where like, you know, if you have a bunch of issues that you know are broken and you're like, oh, well, this is broken, this is broken. If you do a red team, a lot of times you're just going to like, it's the lowest hanging fruit, right? You're going to go for what's easiest. You're not going to waste time. Uh, so you might end up with something that's just like, here's the problems you already knew about. Like, go fix them. So, but with a nice story and, and yeah. like clearly articulating the risk as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but there'd be better ROI with <laughs> you know attack yeah. surface reduction yeah. versus yeah, yeah. versus that. Exactly. So yeah, um, pen tests are a very useful tool within you know the, these are all components within a mature security program at an organization. It's not a, you don't want to do just red teams. You don't want to do just pen tests, you know? So. That's great advice. And that I think that the definitions you provided, that should be the standard because I think you hit on all those important points. And uh, and I think there is a strong distinction uh, when you look at the different, uh, you know, areas of offensive security. And so thank you for providing that. Um, you know, as we're, as we're nearing the end here, you know, I'd like to, again, I mentioned that we have a lot of folks who are either getting into offensive security or they're kind of leveling up their skills. Uh, what, what, you know, personal advice or recommendations would you have for those folks that are, 
that are learning? Um, a couple of things, actually. Like this is true for anything in security. Understand the what, what, uh, what, why, how. Like don't just run a tool, see that things break, and and go with it. Like understand how the tool works. Understand why something broke. Understand how to fix it. And I think that will be valuable in any phase of security, but especially in red teaming because it's not just about breaking something. It's about like weaponizing it. Like what uh, Joe and Manitri said. Uh, the other aspect I would say is like learn to code. I think this is like a super underrated skill in our industry. Scripting and coding is super essential. So understanding how the system works and then automating your skill set to actually write tools for the use case you're in is very valuable. Yeah, I, I generally learn things by writing a tool to do it. <laughs> like that's <laughs> even if it's, I think there's there can be a lot of value in reinventing wheels uh, if it's like an educational thing. Um, so definitely I, I agree wholeheartedly with everything Nir said. Um, I also read a lot. Like yes. I, <laughs> I, I'm a prolific reader. I have a lot, I read almost every security book that comes out. Um, and so I think that's a lot of value. Like I, or at least I find a lot of value in that. I know every, everyone like learns differently. So you also kind of have to learn, or you kind of have to understand how you, you learn. But uh, for me, like uh, reading is, is a huge part of how I uh, learn things. So I definitely recommend <laughs> reading as much as possible, so. Yeah, um, so some of this is, it's, I think the security environment today is a little different from when like I was sort of learning stuff because like there's more information more readily accessible. Um, mm -hmm. One of the things that I've, I've always learned is like, especially when you sort of get your first you know job in the space, you work with people is like, uh, don't be afraid to like as much as possible when some, they see something new or they present something like really learn from it and like extract that technique and use it yourself. Um, because a lot of times, you know, security, at least in my experience, there's like a lot of like hidden knowledge. that's just like, oh, some random person does some trick and you, you may, you could easily just like not notice it and not pay attention, but uh, this could be something really useful later on. So like, I always try to like, especially like the more, you know, it can be easier to say like, I know all of this stuff. I won't listen for new stuff. Um, but really always keep an open mind and be like, okay, so that actually, this person was able to get this working. So what did, what are you doing that I didn't do that like I can absorb and like learn from? And the other thing I'll say is like, you don't have to be born a genius to do this job. Uh, I definitely am not like, a, um, I wasn't born an extremely smart person. So I gotta say, it took a lot of like me banging my head against the same things before I'm like, I get it now. So if you're, you know, if you're running into stuff and you don't get it, that's 100% exactly what I ran into and it's completely fine. Like, you know, there's no, there's no magical, like only these people can do it. Everybody just takes time, you know, learn, learn your own pace, like keep trying, so. But yeah, definitely understanding like how, like one of my favorite security books, is, and Matt knows this, is The, the Tangled Web, yeah. which is, it's a little dated at this point, but um, it's, 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 uh, the title is like, you know, how to secure modern web applications, but the book is actually just about how, like how browsers work. Yeah. It, it doesn't teach you, like, there's nothing in there about like burp or, you know, SQL injection or anything like that. Um, that's often, you know, there's other great books on those topics, like uh, the Web Hacker's Handbook, but Tangled Web is just about like how browsers work and like the different quirks and like the different RFCs and like how different URLs are parsed between different browsers and all the nuances with that. And I found that to be like one of the best like security books I've ever read because even though it's not about vulnerabilities and stuff necessarily, so. Yeah. That's one. I think one last thing to wrap that up is um, actually to measure yourself against your own progress. Don't measure yourself mm -hmm. against, like if I measured myself against these two, I would have a big complex. <laughs> um, and then the other one I would say is, um, Learn to write well. I think red teaming, that's one skill that people don't highlight enough. Yeah, yeah, you write yeah. a lot of reports. You need to articulate why something broke and how. And when you start doing that, you understand the concepts behind it. Because if you can't explain it, that means you go back, read, understand, come back and do it better. So writing is a super valuable skill yeah. in my industry. The, that's the Feynman technique. <laughs> yes. But yeah, uh, yeah I, I can certainly say it from a, from a consultancy, Bishop Fox is uh, pretty heavy on the writing skills. Um, to the point where like we often, or I, I think we still do this, we give like writing challenges to applicants while they're going through the application process to see, because we want to gauge how, how good they are at writing. Um, and like, that's that's definitely an underrated skill. I definitely agree. So, sure. Yeah, I've even taken like going out, like leaving consulting, going to the private security world, like it still is super useful. Just in the fact that you like, if you're going to write up a, a report, like it, it looks so much better and it like such a better quality of work when you can like, you know, send an email that like looks really good or you can like write a report that looks like very formal and like easy to navigate. Like that skill is like super transferable, so. Absolutely. 
Thank you again so much for uh, taking some time out of the short period where we get to all get together and, uh, and see our old friends. Um, we've got uh, we've got some more on the agenda. Again, uh, you know, can't thank you enough. We're going to kick it back over to Omar in the studio, and we'll uh, go on break. Awesome. And I like that. I like the studio part. Uh, so thank you again, guys. I really appreciate your, your help and collaboration here. Uh, amazing uh, uh, thoughts in there. Now, I want to announce something that I'm going to put Barrett on the spot, but we stay tuned for some upcoming giveaways. Uh, we're going to be announcing a few throughout the days. Yesterday, we gave three AWA courses with 60-day labs uh, from Offensive Security today, stay tuned. We're going to be announcing several forms where you can participate. And basically, you will just provide your CTF handle and your Discord handle. And we'll, we'll of course, you know, look for you. Uh, but yesterday, we actually had three winners. And as a matter of fact, that's what I'm going to do uh, in a few seconds. I'm going to go into a break, and I'm going to show you a quick video from Offensive Security congratulating those winners. So once again, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge today and with that let's go in a break thanks for having us So shout out to all the AWA winners. We love to have you. Thank you so much for taking our courses and getting the vouchers, whatever it may be. Congratulations. Uh, we always encourage you to come back. And uh, we have many more certifications uh, in offensive security. We just launched 365. So that's year round uh, for many, many things and a 20% discount. So by all means, swim by the website, check it out. And congratulations to each and every one of you who actually got it.
Knock, knock, who's there? This guy. What's up, Red Teamers? What's up, DEF CON? It's your favorite fake brilliant billionaire investor. My little birdies, cheap, 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 cheap. I like cheap things, that's why I'm rich. They let me know that Lunar Fire is under fire, but that is a Tres Comas company. And that's got so much smart shit in it. And so it's unhackable. Or is it? No, it isn't. Not even you boy and girl geniuses can do it. You would have to be the human equivalents of cars with doors that open like this or like this. Are you? Can you? Will you? Don't. Everyone. I'm Barry Darnell from the Red Team Village, and today we are here with Omar Santos from the Red Team Village, as well as our guest, Ipsect, from Hack the Box. Hey guys, what's going on? Oh. Uh, Ipsect, uh, Hack the Box has been a longtime supporter of the Village. Uh, can you tell me more about the company? Yeah, um, 
Hack the Box is a hands-on security training platform, and our main goal is to make good training readily available to anyone in the world. If you're new to a topic or just the field in general, we have Hack the Box Academy, and it's a guided learning experience, which just means we have written material and hands-on labs. And again, when building this, accessibility was our number one desire. So we created the Pwn Box, which allows you to have a whole operating system in your browser, so the machine you're doing this learning on doesn't even have to be powerful. You can do it on like a Chromebook. If for some reason you want to do it on a phone, you can. I wouldn't recommend that. But everything's done within a web browser. If you want to bring your own OS, we also provide a VPN pack for you so you can join your OS to the VPN and go on learning. In addition to the Academy, we have unguided learning, which is what we're most famous for. This is the weekly challenges machines or entire like networks we put out on the platform and that we ask people not to publicly talk about these challenges until they retire, which is typically 20 weeks. This is my favorite and what I credit most of my success to because it really enforces building good social relationships that not only help get you the help when you need it, but also when teaching, it often validates your understanding of it and it's proven to help memory retention. So I have a lot of friends from my in my social network that include Barry. I met him through another friend who met him at DerbyCon, which is a similar event of Red Team Village. And the funny thing is, both my other friend Kyle and Barry all lived within like 30 miles of each other, but we met like hundreds of miles away. So definitely like important to go view and travel and experience the community because you'll never know who you find and how close people may be. It's a small world. Absolutely. I think we've all been cooped up these last uh, few months here. I think a lot of people are excited to go in person to Las Vegas to attend DEF CON. And so we're really excited to see some of our old friends and, and make some new ones. Um, speaking of, of, of that community, you know, Hack the Box is a very vibrant community, both on their Discord as well as all over Twitter. Can you tell me a little bit more about the people behind Hack the Box, maybe some projects that you might be working on? Yeah, we have a innovation team that's designed at like pushing what we think is the limit. So typically most of our stuff is either a Docker or a VMware image. And the innovation team is looking into Google Cloud, AWS, and Azure to provide a pro lab called Black Sky, which is just based upon those types of features. So if you want to exploit IAM or do a lot of those unique cloud things, Black Sky Lab is going to be that. We also have, as you said, the Discord community. We have Roadrunner who runs that. And they help provide a lot of good support and just learning to anyone in addition to a bunch of CTFs. I think we run the CTF like every other month or something. It's insane. Well, talking about the CTF and talking about all the activities, you know, throughout the years, you guys have supported the Red Team Village tremendously. So first of all, thank you and thank you, uh, Hack the Box. So uh, one of, I got a couple of questions, right? So one of the questions is, you know, what will you say that is the best part about sponsoring community efforts like the Red Team Village CTF this year? I mean, obviously it helps the community grow and most of my like relationships, I can credit almost all my professional success as to leeching off my friend's knowledge because no one can know everything. And I can't speak for anyone at Hack the Box, but I know a bunch of my friends at Hack the Box are super excited to play a CTF built by other people. And we've played the Red Team Village CTS for quite a while. Um, I vaguely remember one, I think two years ago, that involved exploiting a printer, which was new to all of us. We were all like big um, binary exploit people and then it threw a different architecture at us that we never really experimented with. And it was just a lot of fun to play. So super excited to sponsor an event that we can participate in and learn new things to hopefully put out on our platform in the future. Thank you, appreciate that. I think that you're hitting my next question, which is why do you think sponsoring the, the Red Team Village this year is so important for the community? Yeah, um, number one, it's important to, like, with COVID and all, we want to increase the socialization and everything. We've been all cooped up. And the Red Team Village incorporates all of Hack the Boxes things. The main thing was being accessible. Um, if you can't travel, you can do it online and form a team. And additionally, if you want, it's available for the high cost of $0, which aligns with kind of our methodology and what we want. All our machines are available for free for a time, and then once they retire, then you have to pay a small fee to gain access to it because hosting 150 images permanently would just be expensive. Can't do that for free. 
Um, additionally, I believe InfoSec is a unique profession where team building activities have immeasurable impact. If you look at the non-InfoSec teams, they still do team building activities. Like you have that gimmicky trust fall and escape room, et cetera. And they're doing them just to help build that social bond between coworkers. So you know it's valuable since that's the only thing they care about. In the InfoSec world, we have CTFs that is just like that on steroids. It has all that same social bonding benefits. Like I mentioned earlier, I play CTS with Barry. I've played CTS with OXDF, Mr. Ben, John Hammond, a bunch of people. I just have a lot of fun with playing these CTS along with coworkers. And in addition to that social bond that you build, it also gives you a lot of techniques that you may be able to immediately provide your work value because you're joining hands with a bunch of other companies to learn things. It wouldn't surprise me if you do the CTF and then find something you can immediately turn around to do on your job. I remember doing almost any pro lab, I'll use Offer as an example, where the foothold involves exploiting Splunk. And I had a pen test that I kept missing this vector on because I just didn't know it and Mr. Ben put it in that pro lab. So when I did that, it was just like an eye-opening thing of, oh God, what have I been missing? So definitely the big social aspect is huge here. Awesome. And, and uh, I couldn't agree more. And, and, and once again, you know, thank you. I have one more last question. When it's around the benefits that your team actually will receive by participating at the, you know, DEF CON Red Team Village CTF this year. Yeah, um, Hack the Box and Red Team Village are almost anonymous in what we provide and our methodologies. So the only unfortunate thing is the Red Team Village CTF is a yearly thing, while Hack the Box produces new things on a weekly basis. It's probably not to the scale that Red Team Village will be doing just because it's constant. But if you're itching to do more after doing the CTF, definitely check out the platform if you haven't and go over to Hack the Box because I'm sure you'll love the challenges we put on the site. Awesome. So once again, thank you so much for supporting us. Thank you, Hack the Box, you know, for sponsoring the Red Team Village. And I hope to see you at DEF CON. Yeah, gonna... take care. All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, so we are on time right now. I think that uh, just in a few more minutes, the finals will start and the qualifiers will end. So with that, I'll pass it back to Der uh, Barrett and, and Savannah. Hi, everyone. So before we kind of get started with uh, announcing the winners at noon Pacific time, uh, we are going to be doing a giveaway for an OSCP voucher. So Omar is going to be sharing the uh, OSCP survey. Uh, it's a Google form, so you can submit it, and we're going to choose someone at random to win the actual OSCP voucher for 60 days. Um, so you'll be able to play in the lab for 60 days and then also take the exam. So it's a really good opportunity if you want to uh, get the OSCP. And then uh, in the re remainder of the day, we're going to have at 2 p.m. Uh, Henry from Sands. And then at 3 p.m., we're going to have uh, Bruce Schneier. And then at 4 p.m., we're going to have Andy uh, doing keyboard building. So we're really looking forward to that. So once um, Omar, yeah, yeah, see, he has it linked right there to enter to the win the OSCP giveaway. So once we get all the submissions from there, we'll announce the winner later on. Um, Omar, was there anything else that you kind of wanted to add before we're kind of like waiting until noon to? No, I think that from my site, uh, you know, quick reminder, all the conversation, of course, is happening at the DEF CON uh, Discord server and the, the channel, the specific channels in the bottom of the screen. Um, just, just amazed, you know, how many flags actually, you know, people were submitting in the CTF and the participation. So I cannot wait until you guys share, you know, some of the statistics a little bit later and of course announce the winners. Uh, and once again, you know, the, the link to enter the giveaway is in the bottom of the screen. We're going to have two more giveaways later. So if you are not the lucky person, you still have two more chances later today. So with that, I'll, I'll pass it back to you. Yeah, we are just five minutes away from closing uh, the quals. <clears throat> We've had a lot of really, really impressive scores. It's great to see uh, all these teams. I was told that Hack Street Boys are going to do a song after uh, after we close out. Uh, Son of Anton is doing great in fourth place. Our friends over at uh, Neutrino Cannon are trying to get back up higher on the scoreboard. But yeah, we've got uh, a lot of familiar names here. It's great to see that uh, that these teams come back and play the CTF. We are going to finish out this Jeopardy board style, and we're going to go into finals. We've got uh, we've got a really impressive uh, network that we want to share with everyone. And so, 
once we get to um, the once we get to noon and we close everything out, we're gonna take the top 20 teams, and that's who's gonna move the finals. We're gonna have an hour break between when we close out quals and when we kick off finals. Um, I will um, make another announcement when we get there. Let me go check Discord. I did want to talk about how many how many flags we have. Which I did not get DM to me. And while you do that, uh, let me share the schedule uh, for today. Uh, basically, uh, let me sh shift my screen real quick. Um, as Savannah mentioned, you know, we are now about to kick off the the finals in a few minutes at 1 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, we're closing the calls right now in the next four minutes, and then we have a, a few interviews, you know, coming up. Uh, we have a, a, a combined effort within the, the community, especially in participation with the AI Village at 4 p.m. So that's actually a panel that uh, I will be participating with Bruce Schneider and a few others. Uh, so stay tuned. There's a lot of other you know activities actually happening. Uh, and with that, let me share the screen again for the scoreboard. AI generated. You know they're kicking behind. You know kick, kicking butt, and behind them there is EPT. So uh, just three more minutes. Three more minutes. Some yeah. overall some overall stats. We had 645 registered teams. Um, a total of 2,127 different players. Um, our, our overall, like our capped out score is 11,970 total possible points. And that is across 124 different challenges. So we had a lot there on the scoreboard. And I love to see just the submission numbers. Since we've been doing this, uh, just for this uh, last day and a half, we've had 10,000 correct flag submissions and 10,000 incorrect black submissions. So that's quite a bit, a lot of activity there. Yeah, and as a matter of fact, I'm actually trying to create banners as we speak to actually share those numbers. So 10,850 correct submissions, even though I put right in there, but you know, they're correct. <laughs> and then uh, that's an impressive number. Uh, you know, even if you actually submitted a wrong submission, that's okay. They're all, it counts as actually you're playing, you're learning, hopefully you're having fun. Um, and with that, let me actually share also, again, the scoreboard side by side. Um, so back to you. Yeah, you know, if you just keep on submitting the flag, <laughs> it'll maybe just be the correct one. <laughs> and uh, and please don't submit to the uh, OSCP course giveaway 8,000 times. Uh, I think somebody put it in burp, uh, in burp, and we got a ton of submissions, same person. So. Let's uh, just keep that down to one. We've got three more. Uh, we have three total that we're going to give out today. Feel free to just, you know, send them to Barry's DMs on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, another thing is if you actually submit multiple of them, you will be disqualified. So uh, we'll just ignore you, you know. Uh, so um, just make sure that you don't bomb it because, you know, I will do the same. <laughs> to be honest with you. <laughs> but, uh, don't do that. Uh, now, we are have less than a minute left, so if you're holding flags, you better submit them. Yeah, yeah. And look at that. Look at this fourth and fifth place. Neutrino Cannon is trying. He's trying to go to fourth. Thirty seconds left. All right. Actually, I can do a countdown with that. So let's hey, do a thirty Omar. second countdown. Do a, do a let's do a thirty second countdown from now. All right, those 30 seconds went pretty fast. All, All right. right, so we are closed out. Oh, no, I was just going to pass it over to Paris. <laughs> okay. Hey, scroll down a little bit, Omar. Let's see uh, Let's see where we're on the cut here. Um, right there. So, unfortunately, uh, Dark Wolf Solutions. It looks like you, you were just shy of the points to make it into finals. We've got CIA and above. All of those teams are now in the finals. What I'm asking is for just the team lead, the team captain, 
please DM NOP Researcher on Discord. Uh, let them know uh, what team you're on as well as what email was used to register that team so we can validate that information. We've got an hour now where we're gonna transition. We're gonna get you a package that has your VPN, uh, your VPN configuration for your own private network. So for everyone who's watching, so uh, what the finalists get to do now is we're gonna move into our scenario where we have two uh, Windows networks that uh, will, be, uh, will be stood up in a cloud environment. Uh, for safety, we're gonna keep everything contained within a VPN, so it's a little bit gamified, just keep that in mind, but you'll be able to have your whole team connect to that VPN. One thing that we always recommend is, especially if you have a big team, because we know those top five, 10, uh, those, those top five, 10 teams were really huge teams, we try to do things to kind of slow down a huge team. The, uh, the infrastructure itself, the instances that we're using, you can't have you know 45 shells on, so you're gonna to have to work together. There's gonna to be little pieces of intel here and there that you wanna share across. And, uh, and just in general, you, you wanna to work together as a team on this next part. It's gonna be, be fairly immersive. The scenario that we talked about, uh, we called this thing lunar fire, kind of a play on words for the, for the solar winds. Uh, when we started designing this, that was, that was one of the top stories. We thought, that, uh, we thought that that would be the sensational thing that would still be holding true today. Little did we know that 400 other things were just, just huge news uh, in this industry with all the ransomware, especially the things that have uh, affected a lot in the physical realm. So, so lunar fire is our theme. Um, that should cue you in that there's a, there's a supply chain attack involved in our scenario. You've got two networks. One of them has a, a very small attack surface, while another one has something that you can go after. And your, your whole point is to get through that first network and pivot into the next one by hijacking that supply chain and, um, and, uh, and, get, and, you know, and, and getting into the next one. I think I wanna stop talking so I don't give it any more hints. Um, good luck, everyone. Take a break. Uh, yeah, no, good luck, everyone, like uh, Barrett said. And there's there's anything else you want to mention, Omar, feel free to add it. I'm just going to drop a little hint for one of my boxes. I'm just going to say I like notes. That's the that's the hint for mine. Uh, so good luck, and I'll pass it back to Omar. I've got, yeah. I've got one more thing to say. So for folks, because a lot of these teams we saw last year. So um, one thing I will say is that the OS intelligence aspect of this is not as heavy as, as it was last year. I know that we had a lot of flags with that. I just don't want you to spend a whole lot of cycles there. We had a whole 24 hour period where we had flags everywhere. We had them on MySpace, LinkedIn. Uh, I think I think like we made a fake GeoCities website and, and put it up there. So this one, is, it's fairly light, but there is some. Um, it's gonna be spawned off of that one website that we shared earlier, the lunarfire.dev. Uh, um, keep in touch on DM with NOP Researcher. We want to make sure we get contact with all the teams. And, uh, and what we've tried to do is put some minor hints in those personas we created that'll help you out in the finals. So, uh, you know, if you have a big team, go ahead and set some people focused on that to make sure you grab those hints. Awesome. And once again, congratulations to the 20 uh, teams that we, we have in the screen right now. So, um, uh, as Barrett mentioned, some of these uh, are not new to the Red Team Village. So thank you again for supporting the Red Team Village and playing along. And um, I know that Neutrino Cannon actually is pretty much in every single CTF out there for the Red Team Village. So, so good to see you here. And with that, let's actually go in a quick break and we'll be announcing the winners of the OSCP course. So and as a matter of fact, if you just join the giveaway link is in the bottom of the screen and I'm, i'll leave it there during the break for you to participate and we'll announce the num the, the winners at uh, 1 p.m east uh, pacific time all right so with that let's go in the break
Knock, knock, who's there, this guy? What's up, red teamers? What's up, DEF CON? It's your favorite fake, brilliant billionaire investor. My little birdies, cheap, 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 cheap. I like cheap things, that's why I'm rich. They let me know that Lunar Fire is under fire, but that is a Tres Comas company. And that's got so much smart shit in it. And so it's unhackable. Or is it? No, it isn't. Not even you boy and girl geniuses can do it. You would have to be the human equivalents of cars with doors that open like this or like this. Are you? Can you? Will you? Don't. Hi everyone, my name is Savannah Lazara and I am the co-lead of Red Team Village. And today we have Barrett Darnell and Caitlin O'Neill with us from Bishop Fox. And they're gonna be one of our sponsors and we're really thankful for them being a sponsor for our CTF event at DEF CON. And I'll go ahead and let them uh, introduce themselves and we're gonna get them to know them a little bit better today. 
Hi, I'm Caitlin. I'm with recruitment team here at Bishop Fox. Uh, I came over here about three years ago because of our reputation as one of the largest professional services firms focused on offensive security and security as a service. It's been a wild ride, uh, but part of why I stick around is because I love working with such brilliant people. I love that we go out there and break things, build new things, break more things, uh, and, and always working with the latest technologies to keep people safe. So it was a really exciting opportunity for us to sponsor the Red Team Village Capture the Flag this year at DEF CON, uh, where we can't wait to meet people virtually and on site and uh, to, to hopefully find some new ways to grow our team. Hi, Savannah. Nice to see you. I'm Barrett Darnell, Managing Senior Operator at Bishop Fox. I'm part of the Continuous Attack Surface Testing Team, also known as CAST. Well, we're really excited to have you guys on this call today. And I would say the first question that we kind of want to start off with is kind of seeing what you guys would say is the best part of being a sponsor for an event like this. Well, for Bishop Fox, uh, we're avid participants of the greater InfoSec community, and we feel that sponsorship of conferences and efforts like this provide a real tangible value to the community. This CTF in particular provides a tremendous amount of realistic hands-on experiences for those in the offensive security, particularly red teamers. Yeah, no, that's that's awesome. And I mean, I'm sure you know this, Barrett, uh, with so many resources out, resources out there. Uh, why do you think kind of sponsoring something like this is so important? Well, for one, uh, this resource is free. So that barrier of entry is out of the way. Uh, anybody can participate. Secondly, it's realistic. Uh, it mimics real life scenarios that we've seen on our customer engagements. And so it's not very esoteric. Uh, it's you know real tools, real uh, situations you might be in. And it's also beginner friendly. Um, it starts off where everybody can join and get something out of it, but the difficulty ramps up. So uh, there's a lot for experienced red teamers uh, uh, to hone their skills on. Awesome. Uh, and I know we've kind of just talked about the benefits that people who are joining the CTF would get out of it, but can you kind of talk about the benefits Bishop Fox receives out of being a sponsor for the Red Team Village uh, CTF event at DEF CON? Yeah. Well, you know, first and foremost, we always want to give back to the security community. And uh, this is a great way uh, for us to interact with the hundreds, maybe even thousands of attendees and participants. Uh, whether they're they're in person or virtually. Um, it's great um, from where I sit as a recruiter because it gives us a chance to um, meet new talent, uh, people who we maybe haven't engaged with before. And that's really important, especially as we continue to grow uh, our two new service lines, the continua continuous attack service testing team uh, that Barrett is on and our red team. Yeah, no, I mean, Everybody knows in the security community who Bishop Fox is, and I'm sure they would love to know about the recruitment. So I guess what types of uh, people do you guys typically look, look for for the team? Yeah, so you know what we need, um, what we're hiring for can kind of shift month to month. So in the past, if you engage with us and it wasn't a fit, um, that might be changing. So you know, always stay in touch. Um, first and foremost, we look for people who are really passionate about security because that's definitely who uh, we are. And, you know, we're always looking for um, a diversity of thoughts, a diversity of backgrounds. So, uh, you know, we have a lot of people who came from a pretty like traditional career paths, you know, school, work, but we definitely have folks who are self-taught, who are coming from non-traditional backgrounds. Um, you know, we, we love our folks from the military as well. So there's a lot of different paths that can lead you to working at Bishop Fox, and we're really open to exploring all of them. Uh, you know, you can always find me on LinkedIn, Caitlin O'Neill, uh, but you can also engage with Bishop Fox on Twitter. Uh, we have an awesome uh, social media gal. We have a really fun Twitter account. Um, we're going to be on site in Las Vegas, and we're going to be using Twitter to kind of help people find us and, and also find us for some cool uh, giveaways as well. So definitely check us out there. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I'm sure everyone's looking forward to kind of seeing Bishop Fox um, at DEF CON. Did you guys have anything else that you kind of wanted to mention on this call uh, before we end it today? Yeah, I mean, I'm lucky. I just get to show up as a recruiter and a sponsor. I know that all of you guys with the CTF have done so much work. So, you know, thank you for everything you did. Uh, I'm really excited to see it all come together. Uh, and thanks to the Red Team Village for this opportunity. We're really excited to meet everyone. And I just want to say, uh, you know, after months of being on lockdown, I think everyone's itching to get out. This might be the first in-person conference for a lot of people. 
And uh, if you haven't registered yet for DEF CON, I highly recommend it. Uh, the staff at DEF CON is really going above and beyond to make sure that it's a safe environment for all attendees, uh, especially with you know the the um, uh, the latest developments. And so vaccinations will be required, and so will masks for everybody at that conference. And so I think it'll be a pretty safe event. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, seeing old friends and making new ones. So we hope to see everybody at DEF CON this year. Yeah, no, I'm really excited for the event as well. So thank you guys so much for hopping on the call today. And thank you again for Bishop Fox being a sponsor. And we just really appreciate all the help. Thank you, Savannah. Thank you, Savannah. Appreciate thank it. Welcome everyone, I'm Barrett Darnell with the Red Team Village and I'm here today with Ryan Dory and Matt Eidelberg from Optiv. Hey everybody. Hello. How's it going? Ryan and Matt, uh, thank you so much for being here today and I want to uh, thank Optiv for being a sponsor for the Red Team Village CTF this year. Your support really helps uh, and, and it goes a long way at uh, allowing us to provide a big event both in person and virtually. Can you tell me a little bit more about Optiv? 
Yeah, absolutely. So to put it very simply, Opto is a pure play cybersecurity partner. And what does that mean? Uh, we, we aim to do secure, all security all the time, right? We can help in ways of advisory deployment and even manage operations, right? So ultimately our, our goal is very simply to uh, help organiza organizations realize a more effective uh, security program and posture. And uh, for, for both of you specifically, what, what do you do at Optiv? So I'm a senior director inside of threat management, which is a larger umbrella, but I specifically have the privilege of leading our attack and pen team. Um, so my focus is on the direction of success of that team, and I achieve this largely by enabling uh, the great folks around me, such as uh, Mr. Eidelberg here. And I'm a technical manager under uh, Attack and Pen. My primary role is leading the adversarial simulation services. This is our uh, branch that focuses primarily on red and purple team operations. My role in there is not only executing these types of engagements, but also focusing on helping to innovate the team and grow uh, more operators to perform these types of engagements. All right, and uh, and for the for that uh, attack and pen practice, uh, why do you like working there? Yeah, so for me, uh, first and foremost, uh, it's it's the close family atmosphere that we have on the team. Uh, and what I mean by that is, I've been on the team for almost nine years now. I've been in attack and pen the entire time, and I'm not alone in that. There's several other individuals on the team that that have been here for a similar amount of time, such as such as Matt himself. So. What that yielded is a really good dynamic uh, of folks to work well together while we uh, simultaneously you know, pursue our passion of offensive security. And just to add on to that, I would say in a single word, the community. Uh, the team itself uh, honestly strives constantly to push the boundaries, to teach each other new things, whether or not it's a, you know, failures from previous engagements to help educate for future uh, kind of tests or even success stories. It's all about sharing and kind of bolstering each other through knowledge sharing. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, and a plug for that, that giving back to the community aspect, you know, I was on your GitHub the other day and uh, I was looking into Scarecrow and I know I've got that on my list to do a deep dive on after after DEF CON. You know, love, love the fact that, uh, you know, a lot of big players in uh, information security share that research, share that tooling that they create. Yep. That's what we strive to do here. And for your team, um, you know, what types of people work there? What are their backgrounds? So it's a, it's a good variety of backgrounds, right? So we have folks uh, so from being a, a good part of us being veterans uh, to business-minded folks to engineering folks, et cetera, right? Uh, but like I mentioned earlier, there, there's the ultimate uh, commonality, right, of, of a shared objective of offensive and passion for offensive security testing. And then what we qualify that success really is, is helping leave our clients better than we found them at the end of the day. And of course, you know, folks have a very specific uh, or can have a specific subset of interest inside the team. Uh, that could be of IoT to embedded to wireless to low level window stuff to evasion, um, et cetera, right? So there's definitely some, some sub pockets for people to really go a mile deep on. Great, and with such a diverse group, uh, what makes somebody a success in AMP? So aside from uh, technical acumen, which obviously is held, you know, it's an important quality on this specific uh, role, right, uh, is the ability to show ownership and leadership and give back to the team. Um, really, you know, owning a specific service or an offering, uh, helping others, mentoring, et cetera, we hold that in incredibly high value. Um, and then, as we mentioned earlier, with regard to um, like Source Zero and Scarecrow, right, is the, the public thought leadership to help uh, the team immediately and then also give back to the community as well. Yep. And just to add on to that, I would say the eagerness to learn and improve your tradecraft. Um, honestly, the ones we see that excel the most are the ones that not only focus on themselves, but also make sure that they help their fellow teammates or coworkers, whether or not they're struggling with something or helping to help them also pursue and grow their talents. Those are the ones that I see often have the base success here. That's great. Uh, absolutely. I mean, this is this is a team sport uh, doing what we do. <laughs> yep. Uh, for the for the red team village, one thing that we we uh, really love to do is is offer a lot of it, uh, environments for training. We do workshops. We 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 uh, participate in a lot of different cons. Um, and one thing you, you know we want to do is bring as many people into this community as possible. And so I'd I'd like to ask for both of you. Uh, you know, what is your advice for people who are interested in cybersecurity as a profession? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I'll speak to, the, you know, the path that I took to get here, and I think it, it holds true to the to the question, right? But it, I think it's very important and imperative for folks to have a, a deep foundational understanding to, as to how uh, things work, right? So what I mean by that is 
how does Active Directory work? How does networking function? How can you manipulate these things to maybe work outside the bounds it was intended to, right? So that can apply to even development, web applications, et cetera. Um, oftentimes I get asked by people that are a bit younger, say in college or whatever, and they're like, hey, should I take this security class and become a pen tester? Well, I would really encourage folks to get a lot of those more foundational understandings to how things work before they move to the stage of trying to, you know, move to that adversarial emulation type part. Yep, and I would just add uh, to not just focus when you're learning on red team tactics. It's incredibly valuable in the current landscape to uh, focus on both blue and red team. Having that ability to speak both can really augment your skill set. And you know, this is very much a cat and mouse game based industry. And just knowing both sides, their playbooks can really help you understand the strengths and weaknesses of both sides. So when you're coming up against, say, a red team or a blue team, you know what they are great at and what their weaknesses are to really help plan out those attacks or even your knowledge set to improve on. Those that is phenomenal advice. Uh, this industry is is a challenge because there's so much breadth and depth that you can take. Uh, not to mention that it's evolving every single day. So it's impossible to keep up. So you've you've got to have that thirst for knowledge. And uh, and without that foundation, it, it is quite difficult. I mean, you might throw that exploit and get that get that shell back, but then the question is, what do you do next, right? And so, uh, great advice. I want to thank both of you for being here today. Uh, thank you again for the sponsorship. Looking forward to uh, to meeting you in person and uh, and also with uh, with DefCon right around the corner. You know, uh, looking to to engage with old friends and 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 make some new ones. So so thank you again. Absolutely, thank you for the opportunity, and uh, we're looking forward to seeing some folks out at DefCon. Yep.
Welcome everyone. I'm Barrett Darnell with the Red Team Village, and I'm here today with Ryan Dory and Matt Eidelberg from Optiv. Hey everybody. Hello. How's it going? Ryan and Matt, uh, thank you so much for being here today. And I want to uh, thank Optiv for being a sponsor for the Red Team Village CTF this year. Your support really helps uh, and, and it goes a long way at uh, allowing us to provide a big event both in person and virtually. Can you tell me a little bit more about Optiv? Yeah, absolutely. So to put it very simply, Optiv is a pure play cybersecurity partner. And what does that mean? Uh, we, we aim to do secure, all security all the time, right? We can help in ways of advisory deployment and even manage operations, right? So ultimately our, our goal is very simply to uh, help organiza organizations realize a more effective uh, security program and posture. And uh, for, for both of you specifically, what, what do you do at Optiv? So I'm a senior director inside of threat management, which is a larger umbrella, but I specifically have the privilege of leading our attack and pen team. Um, so my focus is on the direction of success of that team. And I achieve this largely by enabling uh, the great folks around me, such as uh, Mr. Eidelberg here. And I'm a technical manager under uh, attack and pen. My primary role is leading the adversarial simulation services. This is our uh, branch that focuses primarily on red and purple team operations. My role in there is not only executing these types of engagements, but also focusing on helping to innovate the team and grow uh, more operators to perform these types of engagements. All right, and uh, and for the for that uh, attack and pen practice, uh, why do you like working there? Yeah, so for me, uh, first and foremost, uh, it's it's the close family atmosphere that we have on the team. Uh, and what I mean by that is I've been on the team for almost nine years now. I've been in Attack and Pen the entire time, and I'm not alone in that. There's several other individuals on the team that, that have been here for a similar amount of time, such as, such as Matt himself. So what that yielded is a really good dynamic uh, of folks to work well together while we uh, simultaneously you know, pursue our passion of offensive security. And just to add on to that, I would say in a single word, the community. Uh, the team itself uh, honestly strives constantly to push the boundaries, to teach each other new things, whether or not it's a, you know, failures from previous engagements to help educate for future uh, kind of tests or even success stories. It's all about sharing and kind of bolstering each other through knowledge sharing. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, and a plug for that, that giving back to the community aspect, you know, I was on your GitHub the other day and uh, I was looking into Scarecrow and I know I've got that on my list to do a deep dive on after after DEF CON. You know, love, love the fact that, uh, you know, a lot of big players in uh, information security share that research, share that tooling that they create. Yep. That's what we strive to do here. And for your team, um, you know, what types of people work there? What are their backgrounds? So it's a, it's a good variety of backgrounds, right? So we have folks uh, so from being a, a good part of us being veterans uh, to business-minded folks to engineering folks, et cetera, right? Uh, but like I mentioned earlier, there, there's the ultimate uh, commonality, right, of, of a shared objective of offensive and passion for offensive security testing. And then what we qualify that success really is, is helping leave our clients better than we found them at the end of the day. And of course, you know, folks have a very specific uh, or can have a specific subset of interest inside the team. Uh, that could be of IoT to embedded to wireless to low level window stuff to evasion, um, et cetera, right? So there's definitely some, some sub pockets for people to really go a mile deep on. Great, and with such a diverse group, uh, what makes somebody a success in AMP? So aside from uh, technical acumen, which obviously is held, you know, it's an important quality on this specific uh, role, right, uh, is the ability to show ownership and leadership and give back to the team. Um, really, you know, owning a specific service or an offering, uh, helping others, mentoring, et cetera, we hold that in incredibly high value. Um, and then as we mentioned earlier with regard to um, like Source Zero and Scarecrow, right, is the, the public thought leadership to help uh, the team immediately and then also give back to the community as well. Yep. And just to add on to that, I would say the eagerness to learn and improve your tradecraft. Um, honestly, the ones we see that excel the most are the ones that not only focus on themselves, but also make sure that they help their fellow teammates or coworkers, whether or not they're struggling with something or helping to help them also pursue and grow their talents. Those are the ones that I see often have the base success here. That's great. Uh, absolutely. I mean, this is this is a team sport uh, doing what we do. <laughs> yep. 
for the for the red team village one thing that we we uh really love to do is is offer a lot of it, uh environments for training we do workshops we 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 uh participate in a lot of different cons um and one thing you, you know we want to do is bring as many people into this community as possible and so I'd, I'd like to ask for both of you, uh, you know, what is your advice for people who are interested in cybersecurity as a profession? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I'll speak to, the, you know, the path that I took to get here, and I think it, it holds true to the to the question, right? But I think it's very important and imperative for folks to have a, a deep foundational understanding to, as to how uh, things work, right? So what I mean by that is, how does Active Directory work? How does networking function? How can you manipulate these things to maybe work outside the bounds it was intended to, right? So that can apply to even development, web applications, et cetera. Um, oftentimes I get asked by people that are a bit younger, say in college or whatever, and they're like, hey, should I take this security class and become a pen tester? Well, I would really encourage folks to get a lot of those more foundational understandings to how things work before they move to the stage of trying to, you know, move to that adversarial emulation type part. Yep, and I would just add uh, to not just focus when you're learning on red team tactics. It's incredibly valuable in the current landscape to uh, focus on both blue and red team. Having that ability to speak both can really augment your skill set. And you know, this is very much a cat and mouse game based industry. And just knowing both sides, their playbooks can really help you understand the strengths and weaknesses of both sides. So when you're coming up against, say, a red team or a blue team, you know what they are great at and what their weaknesses are to really help plan out those attacks or even your knowledge set to improve on. Those That is phenomenal advice. Uh, this industry is is a challenge because there's so much breadth and depth that you can take, uh, not to mention that it's evolving every single day. So it's impossible to keep up. So you've, you've got to have that thirst for knowledge. And uh, and without that foundation, it, it is quite difficult. I mean, you might throw that exploit and get that, get that shell back, but then the question is, what do you do next, right? And so, <laughs> Uh, great advice. I want to thank both of you for being here today. Uh, thank you again for the sponsorship. Looking forward to uh, to meeting you in person and uh, and also with uh, with DefCon right around the corner. You know, uh, looking to to engage with old friends and 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 make some new ones. So so thank you again. Absolutely. Thank you for the opportunity, and uh, we're looking forward to seeing some folks out at DefCon.
Great, welcome back, everybody. And uh, with me, I have not researcher and uh, Savannah. Um, but before we get started and announce the winner of the OSCP course, let's go over some of the statistics uh, about the CTF that we shared earlier. But you know, we have it a little bit better formatted now. So with that, uh, I'll pass it back to um, to Savannah and, and Nop. Oh, great! Uh, thanks a lot. Omar and I definitely appreciate all the teams, you know, that played in the qual uh, qualification round. It was really great. A lot of, you know, great interaction in the channel and everything like that. A lot of movement on the scoreboard, even all the way up, you know, into the last, you know, few minutes of it. So it was great to see all that. And, uh, you know, there's definitely some teams that were in that top 20 that kind of got knocked out of that last minute, you know. So it was awesome competition. I really enjoyed it. But as you can see there, you know, 1,360 users, you know, 645 teams. So really awesome. Um you know, almost uh, 12,000 points uh, available there. And then, you know, kind of like what we talked about earlier, uh, there's about 20,000 flag submissions total, you know, half from right, half from wrong, but it was, uh, you know, great competition, a lot going on there. Yeah, no, and we're excited to finally actually get to start the uh, finals. So in the next few minutes, if you haven't received the email yet, you will in the next few minutes with the connection pack for the VPN to be able to play in the finals. So if you have not uh, sent the email for your captain, then you need to send it to NALP Researcher, uh, which is right here, uh, to make sure he can get that information to you so you can start the finals with your team. And then we can go ahead and announce the winner for the OSCP voucher. Do you want to? Yep. Yeah, so it's good speed. <laughs> uh, so congratulations, good speed for winning that. Uh, we'll go ahead and get the voucher over to you. And then we're actually going to be doing another um, survey. So. We will be announcing that soon, and then that will be the next voucher that will be given out for the OSCP. So I know everyone's really eager to start these final rounds. Uh, just give us a moment here uh, as we kind of finish up this stream, as well as uh, getting the uh, emails sent out. So in each one of those emails, we're going to have a connection pack, so we have an open VPN connection, uh, as well as a welcome message, which you know has a few hints, uh, also kind of suggestions. Uh, please read that. It's uh, very uh, imperative that you read that, otherwise you will not be successful. Uh, so with that, um, once we get that sent out, uh, you'll be able to go to the scoreboard. Hopefully everyone's logged in on that. So uh, I've DM'd everyone the scoreboard for their team to register at. Uh, obviously, if you haven't DM'd me uh, after this stream is over, I'll be able to get back to you and send you everything to log in there. Uh, but you will definitely get the connection pack uh, via whatever email you registered with uh, or that I confirmed. So with that, we'll be starting to kick that off. Hey, Barrett, how are we doing on the email? All right, still only two minutes. So in two minutes here, you'll be actually getting that back. So uh, definitely, you know, kind of like what Barry was talking about earlier, you know, maybe not as uh, full on the OSINT on some of the socials, but there definitely is information out there. Uh, so, you know, just keep on digging, look around, see what we have out there. Uh, a lot of good information. Uh, so with that, though, I'm trying to think here. We can... Uh, can see here. There we go. So while you pull this up, uh, I want to thank the sponsors again. You know, without you, this event will not be happening at all. Uh, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, you have been seeing some of the pre-recorded interviews with some of the sponsors in in there. So especially Bishop Shop, uh, Bishop Fox. <laughs> <laughs> Great, great. <laughs> and uh, uh, Optive as well, so so thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> All right, so definitely here in a, in a couple minutes, you'll get that. It'll actually be an open. You sent it? All right, so right now you should be receiving an email with the open VPN configs. We have 10, or sorry, 18 teams registered so far. So definitely hit me up in a DM after this. Make sure that I'll get you registered. Uh, but all the teams that at least we have emails for, we'll get a connection pack at this time. Uh, and all the challenges should be visible at this time. So with that, uh, for the challenges, uh, the flag submission will be based on host name. So host name and then the flag, and then you'll be able to kind of go through there uh, and hopefully find each one. So it's more of a scenario, so it's not very, you know, necessarily as like linear you know, challenge A or whatever. Uh, as you go through the environment, you'll come across the different flags and you'll be able to kind of correlate each one of those flags with the host name, as well as, you know, whether it's a file name or 
something else, it'll it'll be indicative of which flag it is. Uh, you know, there's no no issues submitting that flag multiple times, uh, just to ensure you know you're on the right uh, the right challenge. So, with that, everyone should have an email at this time as well as logged in on the scoreboard. Everything is visible. So good luck to all the contestants out there. Good luck. Omar, do you want to? Oh, I think you're muted, Omar. I am muted. I am not Sorry. sure. All right. So sure they don't see, hear me typing. Uh, so um, so the so, first thing is, of course, go ahead. Omar, we'll get you the uh, the updated scoreboard for the new teams. Uh, everyone's just getting logged in right now, but that is their top twenty teams. So each one of those are are you know getting their connection. They're getting connected right now, uh, starting to log into the environment, and obviously it'll be a kind of a slow start as they figure out exactly you know what the scenario, the beginning of the scenario, what it kind of looks like. So a lot of clues that are out there, uh, both within the welcome message as well as Mosin. And then if you might have seen some things publicly before. Please go back and check them again. You know, some of them might have been updated with some new information that you didn't see before. Awesome. So if you just join us, or at least if Goodspeed just join us, you know, congratulations. You're the winner of the first OSCP course of the day. We have two more, so stay tuned. We're going to be actually, you know, providing the, the form where you can sign up in the next few minutes. And one quick reminder, if you actually submit more than one submission, you're automatically disqualified. So just submit once if you actually want to win. If not, you will be automatically disqualified. So with that, let's go in a quick break, and we'll be back in the next few minutes. Thanks again. Bye.
Knock who's there, this guy. What's up, red teamers? What's up, DEFCON? It's your favorite fake brilliant billionaire investor. My little birdies, cheap, 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 cheap. I like cheap things, that's why I'm rich. They let me know that Lunar Fire is under fire, but that is a Tres Comas company. And that's got so much smart shit in it. And so it's unhackable. Or is it? No, it isn't. Not even you boy and girl geniuses can do it. You would have to be the human equivalents of cars with doors that open like this or like this. Are you? Can you? Will you? Don't. Welcome everyone, I'm Bear Darnell with the Red Team Village and I'm here today with Ryan Dory and Matt Eidelberg from Optiv. Hey everybody. Hello. How's it going? Ryan and Matt, uh, thank you so much for being here today and I want to uh, thank Optiv for being a sponsor for the Red Team Village CTF this year. Your support really helps uh, and, and it goes a long way 
at uh, allowing us to provide a big event both in person and virtually. Can you tell me a little bit more about Optiv? Yeah, absolutely. So to put it very simply, Optiv is a pure play cybersecurity partner. And what does that mean? Uh, we, we aim to do secure, all security all the time, right? We can help in ways of advisory deployment and even manage operations, right? So ultimately our, our goal is very simply to uh, help organiza organizations realize a more effective uh, security program and posture. And uh, for, for both of you specifically, what, what do you do at Optiv? So I'm a senior director inside of threat management, which is a larger umbrella, but I specifically have the privilege of leading our attack and pen team. Um, so my focus is on the direction of success of that team, and I achieve this largely by enabling uh, the great folks around me, such as uh, Mr. Eidelberg here. And I'm a technical manager under uh, attack and pen. My primary role is leading the adversarial simulation services. This is our uh, branch that focuses primarily on red and purple team operations. My role in there is not only executing these types of engagements, but also focusing on helping to innovate the team and grow uh, more operators to perform these types of engagements. All right, and uh, and for the for that uh, attack and pen practice, uh, why do you like working there? Yeah, so for me, uh, first and foremost, uh, it's it's the close family atmosphere that we have on the team. Uh, and what I mean by that is I've been on the team for almost nine years now. I've been in Attack and Pen the entire time, and I'm not alone in that. There's several other individuals on the team that, that have been here for a similar amount of time, such as, such as Matt himself. So what that yielded is a really good dynamic uh, of folks to work well together while we uh, simultaneously you know, pursue our passion of offensive security. And just to add on to that, I would say in a single word, the community. Uh, the team itself uh, honestly strives constantly to push the boundaries, to teach each other new things, whether or not it's a, you know, failures from previous engagements to help educate for future uh, kind of tests or even success stories. It's all about sharing and kind of bolstering each other through knowledge sharing. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, and a plug for that, that giving back to the community aspect, you know, I was on your GitHub the other day and uh, I was looking at the Scarecrow and I know I've got that on my list to do a deep dive on after after DEF CON. You know, love love the fact that, uh, you know, a lot of big players in uh, information security share that research, share that tooling that they create. Yep. That's what we strive to do here. And for your team, um, you know, what types of people work there? What are their backgrounds? So it's a, it's a good variety of backgrounds, right? So we have folks uh, some, from being a, a good part of us being veterans uh, to business-minded folks, to engineering folks, et cetera, right? Uh, but like I mentioned earlier, there, there's the ultimate uh, commonality, right, of, of a shared objective of offensive and passion for offensive security testing. And then what we qualify that success really is, is helping leave our clients better than we found them at the end of the day. And of course, you know, folks have a very specific uh, or can have a specific subset of interest inside the team. Uh, that could be of IoT to embedded to wireless to low level window stuff to evasion, um, et cetera, right? So there's definitely some, some sub pockets for people to really go a mile deep on. Great. And with such a diverse group, uh, what makes somebody a success in AMP? So aside from uh, technical acumen, which obviously is held, you know, it's an important quality on this specific uh, role, right, uh, is the ability to show ownership and leadership and give back to the team. Um, really, you know, owning a specific service or an offering, uh, helping others, mentoring, et cetera, we hold that in incredibly high value. Um, and then as we mentioned earlier with regard to um, like Source Zero and Scarecrow, right, is the, the public thought leadership to help uh, the team immediately and then also give back to the community as well. Yep. And just to add on to that, I would say the eagerness to learn and improve your tradecraft. Um, honestly, the ones we see that excel the most are the ones that not only focus on themselves, but also make sure that they help their fellow teammates or coworkers, whether or not they're struggling with something or helping to help them also pursue and grow their talents. Those are the ones that I see often have the biggest success here. That's great. Uh, absolutely. I mean, this is this is a team sport uh, doing what we do. <laughs> yep. Uh, for the for the red team village, one thing that we we uh, really love to do is is offer a lot of it, uh, environments for training. We do workshops. We 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 uh, participate in a lot of different cons. Um, and one thing you, you know we want to do is bring as many people into this community as possible. And so I'd I'd like to ask for both of you. Uh, you know, what is your advice for people who are interested in cybersecurity as a profession? 
Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, I'll speak to the, you know the path that I took to get here, and I think it, it holds true to the to the question, right? But it, I think it's very important and imperative for folks to have a a deep foundational understanding to, as to how uh, things work, right? So what I mean by that is how does Active Directory work? How does networking function? How can you manipulate these things to maybe work outside the bounds it was intended to, right? So that can apply to even development, web applications, et cetera. Um, oftentimes I get asked by people that are a bit younger, say in college or whatever, and they're like, hey, should I take this security class and become a pen tester? Well, I would really encourage folks to get a lot of those more foundational understandings to how things work before they move to the stage of trying to, you know, move to that adversarial emulation type part. Yep, and I would just add uh, to not just focus when you're learning on red team tactics. It's incredibly valuable in the current landscape to uh, focus on both blue and red team. Having that ability to speak both can really augment your skill set. And you know, this is very much a cat and mouse game-based industry. And just knowing both sides, their playbooks, can really help you understand the strengths and weaknesses of both sides. So when you're coming up against, say, a red team or a blue team, you know what they are great at and what their weaknesses are to really help plan out those attacks or even your knowledge set to improve on. Those that is phenomenal advice. Uh, this industry is is a challenge because there's so much breadth and depth that you can take. Uh, not to mention that it's evolving every single day. So it's impossible to keep up. So you've you've got to have that thirst for knowledge. And uh, and without that foundation, it, it is quite difficult. I mean, you might throw that exploit and get that get that shell back, but then the question is, what do you do next, right? And so, uh, great advice. I want to thank both of you for being here today. Uh, thank you again for the sponsorship. Looking forward to uh, to meeting you in person and uh, and also with uh, with DefCon right around the corner. You know, uh, looking to to engage with old friends and 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 make some new ones. So so thank you again. Absolutely. Thank you for the opportunity, and uh, we're looking forward to seeing some folks out at DefCon. Yep. Thank you. Oh, and I forgot.
Knock, knock, who's there, this guy? What's up, red teamers? What's up, DEF CON? It's your favorite fake brilliant billionaire investor. My little birdies, cheap, 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 cheap. I like cheap things, that's why I'm rich. They let me know that Lunar Fire is under fire, but that is a Tres Comas company. And that's got so much smart shit in it. And so it's unhackable. Or is it? No, it isn't. Not even you boy and girl geniuses can do it. You would have to be the human equivalents of cars with doors that open like this or like this. Are you? Can you? Will you? Don't. Many, many things get a 20% discount. So 
by all means, swing by the website, check it out, and congratulations to each and every one of you who actually got it. Thumbs up, man. Alright, bye everyone.
I'm Barry Garnell from the Red Team Village, and today we are here with Omar Santos from the Red Team Village, as well as our guest, Ipsect, from Hack the Box. Hey, guys. What's going on? Hello. Uh, Ipsect, uh, Hack the Box has been a longtime supporter of the Village. Uh, can you tell me more about the company? Yeah. Um, Hack the Box is a hands-on security training platform, and our main goal is to make good training readily available to anyone in the world. If you're new to a topic or just the field in general, we have Hack the Box Academy, and it's a guided learning experience, which just means we have written material and hands-on labs. And again, when building this, accessibility was our number one desire. So we created the Pwn Box, which allows you to have a whole operating system in your browser, so the machine you're doing this learning on doesn't even have to be powerful. You can do it on like a Chromebook. If for some reason you want to do it on a phone, you can. I wouldn't recommend that. But everything's done within a web browser. If you want to bring your own OS, we also provide a VPN pack for you so you can join your OS to the VPN and go on learning. In addition to the Academy, we have unguided learning, which is what we're most famous for. This is the weekly challenges machines or entire like networks we put out on the platform and that we ask people not to publicly talk about these challenges until they retire, which is typically 20 weeks. This is my favorite and what I credit most of my success to because it really enforces building good social relationships that not only help get you the help when you need it, but also when teaching, it often validates your understanding of it and it's proven to help memory retention. So I have a lot of friends from my in my social network that include Barry. I met him through another friend who met him at DerbyCon, which is a similar event of Red Team Village. And the funny thing is, both my other friend, Kyle and Barry, all lived within like 30 miles of each other, but we met like hundreds of miles away. So definitely like important to go view and travel and 
experience the community because you'll never know who you find and how close people may be. It's a small world. Absolutely. I think we've all been cooped up these last uh, few months here. I think a lot of people are excited to go in person to Las Vegas to attend DEF CON. And so we're really excited to see some of our old friends and, and make some new ones. Um, speaking of, of, of that community, you know, Hack the Box is a very vibrant community, both on their Discord as well as all over Twitter. Can you tell me a little bit more about the people behind Hack the Box, maybe some projects that you might be working on? Yeah, we have a innovation team that's designed at like pushing what we think is the limit. So typically most of our stuff is either a Docker or a VMware image. And the innovation team is looking into Google Cloud, AWS, and Azure to provide a pro lab called Black Sky, which is just based upon those types of features. So if you want to exploit IAM or do a lot of those unique cloud things, Black Sky Lab is going to be that. We also have, as you said, the Discord community. We have Roadrunner who runs that. And they help provide a lot of good support and just learning to anyone in addition to a bunch of CTFs. I think we run the CTF like every other month or something. It's insane. Well, talking about the CTF and talking about all the activities, you know, throughout the years, you guys have supported the Red Team Village tremendously. So first of all, thank you and thank you, uh, Hack the Box. So uh, one of, I got a couple of questions, right? So one of the questions is, you know, what will you say that is the best part about sponsoring community efforts like the Red Team Village CTF this year? I mean, obviously it helps the community grow. And most of my like relationships, I can credit almost all my professional success as to leeching off my friend's knowledge because no one can know everything. And I can't speak for anyone at Hack the Box, but I know a bunch of my friends at Hack the Box are super excited to play a CTF built by other people. And we've played the Red Team Village CTS for quite a while. Um, I vaguely remember one, I think two years ago, that involved exploiting a printer, which was new to all of us. We were all like big um, binary exploit people and then it threw a different architecture at us that we never really experimented with. And it was just a lot of fun to play. So super excited to sponsor an event that we can participate in and learn new things to hopefully put out on our platform in the future. Thank you, appreciate that. I think that you're hitting my next question, which is why do you think sponsoring the, the Red Team Village this year is so important for the community? Yeah, um, number one, it's important to, like, with COVID and all, we want to increase the socialization and everything. We've been all cooped up. And the Red Team Village incorporates all of Hack the Boxes things. The main thing was being accessible. Um, if you can't travel, you can do it online and form a team. And additionally, if you want, it's available for the high cost of zero dollars, which aligns with kind of our methodology and what we want. All our machines are available for free for a time. And then once they retire, then you have to pay a small fee to gain access to it because hosting 150 images permanently would just be expensive. Can't do that for free. Um, additionally, I believe InfoSec is a unique profession where team building activities have immeasurable impact. If you look at the non-InfoSec teams, they still do team building activities. Like you have that gimmicky trust fall and escape room, et cetera. And they're doing them just to help build that social bond between coworkers. So you know it's valuable since that's the only thing they care about. In the infosec world, we have CTFs that is just like that on steroids. It has all that same social bonding benefits. Like I mentioned earlier, I play CTS with Barry. I've played CTS with OXDF, Mr. Ben. John Hammond, a bunch of people. I just have a lot of fun with playing these CTFs along with coworkers. And in addition to that social bond that you build, it also gives you a lot of techniques that you may be able to immediately provide your work value because you're joining hands with a bunch of other companies to learn things. It wouldn't surprise me if you do the CTF and then find something you can immediately turn around to do on your job. I remember doing almost any pro lab, I'll use Offra as an example, where the foothold involves exploiting Splunk. And I had a pen test that I kept missing this vector on because I just didn't know it and Mr. Ben put it in that pro lab. So when I did that, it was just like an eye-opening thing of, oh God, what have I been missing? So definitely the big social aspect is huge here. Awesome. And and uh, I couldn't agree more. And, and, and once again, you know, thank you. I have one more last question. When, it's around the benefits that your team actually will receive by participating at the you know DEF CON Red Team Village CTF this year. Yeah, um, Hack the Box and Red Team Village are almost anonymous in what we provide and our methodologies. So 
the only unfortunate thing is the red team village ctf is a yearly thing while hack the box produces new things on a weekly basis it's probably not to the scale that red team village will be doing just because it's constant but if you're itching to do more after doing the ctf definitely check out the platform if you haven't and go over to hack the box because i'm sure you'll love the challenges we put on the site awesome so once again thank you so much for supporting us thank you hack the box you know for sponsoring the red team village and i hope to see you at defcon have yeah, take care. Hi everyone, my name is Savannah Lazara and I am the co-lead of Red Team Village. And today we have Barrett Darnell and Caitlin O'Neill with us from Bishop Fox. And they're gonna be one of our sponsors. So we're really thankful for them being a sponsor for our CTF event at DEF CON. And I'll go ahead and let them uh, introduce themselves and we're gonna get them to know them a little bit better today. Hi, I'm Caitlin. I'm with recruitment team here at Bishop Fox. 
Uh, I came over here about three years ago because of our reputation as one of the largest professional services firms focused on offensive security and security as a service. It's been a wild ride, uh, but part of why I stick around is because I love working with such brilliant people. I love that we go out there and break things, build new things, break more things, uh, and, and always working with the latest technologies to keep people safe. So it was a really exciting opportunity for us to sponsor the Red Team Village Capture the Flag this year at DEF CON, uh, where we can't wait to meet people virtually and on site and uh, to, to hopefully find some new ways to grow our team. Hi, Savannah. Nice to see you. I'm Barrett Darnell, Managing Senior Operator at Bishop Fox. I'm part of the Continuous Attack Surface Testing Team, also known as CAST. Well, we're really excited to have you guys on this call today. And I would say the first question that we kind of want to start off with is kind of seeing what you guys would say is the best part of being a sponsor for an event like this. Well, for Bishop Fox, uh, we're avid participants of the greater InfoSec community, and we feel that sponsorship of conferences and efforts like this provide a real tangible value to the community. This CTF in particular provides a tremendous amount of realistic hands-on experiences for those in the offensive security, particularly red teamers. Yeah, no, that's that's awesome. And I mean, I'm sure you know this, Barrett, uh, with so many resources out, resources out there. Uh, why do you think kind of sponsoring something like this is so important? Well, for one, uh, this resource is free. So that barrier of entry is out of the way. Uh, anybody can participate. Secondly, it's realistic. Uh, it mimics real life scenarios that we've seen on our customer engagements. And so it's not very esoteric. Uh, it's you know real tools, real uh, situations you might be in. And it's also beginner friendly. Um, it starts off where everybody can join and get something out of it, but the difficulty ramps up. So uh, there's a lot for experienced red teamers uh, uh, to hone their skills on. Awesome. Uh, and I know we've kind of just talked about the benefits that people who are joining these CTF would get out of it, but can you kind of talk about the benefits Bishop Fox receives out of being a sponsor for the Red Team Village uh, CTF event at DEF CON? Yeah. Well, you know, first and foremost, we always want to give back to the security community. And uh, this is a great way uh, for us to interact with the hundreds, maybe even thousands of attendees and participants. Uh, whether they're they're in person or virtually. Um, it's great um, from where I sit as a recruiter because it gives us a chance to um, meet new talent, uh, people who we maybe haven't engaged with before. And that's really important, especially as we continue to grow uh, our two new service lines, the continu continuous attack service testing team uh, that Barrett is on and our red team. Yeah, no, I mean, Everybody knows in the security community who Bishop Fox is, and I'm sure they would love to know about the recruitment. So I guess what types of uh, people do you guys typically look, look for for the team? Yeah, so you know what we need and what we're hiring for can kind of shift month to month. So in the past, if you engaged with us and it wasn't a fit, um, that might be changing. So you know, always stay in touch. Um, first and foremost, we look for people who are really passionate about security because that's definitely who uh, we are. And, you know, we're always looking for um, a diversity of thoughts, a diversity of backgrounds. So, uh, you know, we have a lot of people who came from a pretty like, traditional career paths, you know, school work, but we definitely have folks who are self-taught, who are coming from non-traditional backgrounds. Um, you know, we, we love our folks from the military as well. So there's a lot of different paths that can lead you to working at Bishop Fox, and we're really open to exploring all of them. Uh, you know, you can always find me on LinkedIn, Caitlin O'Neill, uh, but you can also engage with Bishop Fox on Twitter. Uh, we have an awesome uh, social media gal. We have a really fun Twitter account. Um, we're going to be on site in Las Vegas, and we're going to be using Twitter to kind of help people find us and, and also find us for some cool uh, giveaways as well. So definitely check us out there. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I'm sure everyone's looking forward to kind of seeing Bishop Fox um, at DEF CON. Did you guys have anything else that you kind of wanted to mention on this call uh, before we end it today? Yeah, I mean, I'm lucky. I just get to show up as a recruiter and a sponsor. I know that all of you guys with the CTF have done so much work. So, you know, thank you for everything you did. Uh, I'm really excited to see it all come together. Uh, and thanks to the Red Team Village for this opportunity. We're really excited to meet everyone. And I just want to say, uh, you know, after months of being on lockdown, I think everyone's itching to get out. This might be the first in-person conference for a lot of people. 
And uh, if you haven't registered yet for DEF CON, I highly recommend it. Uh, the staff at DEF CON is really going above and beyond to make sure that it's a safe environment for all attendees, uh, especially with you know the the um, uh, the latest developments. And so vaccinations will be required, and so will masks for everybody at that conference. And so I think it'll be a pretty safe event. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, seeing old friends and making new ones. So we hope to see everybody at DEF CON this year. Yeah, no, I'm really excited for the event as well. So thank you guys so much for hopping on the call today. And thank you again for Bishop Fox being a sponsor. And we just really appreciate all the help. Thank you, Savannah. Thank you, Savannah. Appreciate thank it. Yeah, we have. No, there we go.
Omar, I can't hear you. Can you hear me? Oh, sorry, I was double muted. All right. So, um, so once again, you know, congratulations, good speed. You're the first winner of the OSCP course uh, here today. We're going to announce another giveaway in the next few minutes. So look out in the bottom of your screen in the next few minutes. And uh, with that, I'll pass it back to Barrett. Hey folks, welcome back. Uh, I've got our next guest here. I'm going to be speaking with uh, with Henry Van Gotham from Sands. Hi, thanks, Barrett. Thanks for having me on the show. And uh, and we want to talk about some of the curriculum. Uh, I've been involved with Sands for quite a bit. First as a student, and then uh, as an instructor. And so Sands is a sponsor for this event. We have a free Sands course that we're giving out uh, for the first place team of finals. And so that's a, that's a great prize. You can take that in any modality, whether it's going to be live online or uh, or in one of our in-person events. And so I invited Henry onto the stream so we can just kind of talk about the curriculum. Um, the first thing, you know, let's talk about the offensive operations curriculum. Can you kind of sure. go over what that what that focuses on? Absolutely. And so we've got a, a slide on the screen here, basically. Uh, we, you know, Steve Sims is our technical director for the offensive operations curriculum. And if you've watched what's happened in probably about the last several months, we've transformed what was formerly for a long, long time, the SANS pen testing curriculum to a offensive operations curriculum. And I'll cover some of the breakout basically as to why we did that. Uh, you know, one of the, the main reasons though was we covered the, you know, a lot of the uh, baseline of, you know, the, the uh, I guess, how can I uh, phrase it here? Basically TTP awareness basically in Josh Rake's Security 504 course uh, and then what to do with regard to incident handling. We covered a lot of the vulnerability uh, scanning and vulnerability assessment threat modeling stuff in Matt Toussaint's uh, Security 460 course over at the top there. And then we go, went uh, deep dive in, you know, with network uh, authorized network pen testing in Tim Bedeen's Security 560 course uh, in the center there in that pen testing comprehensive area. Uh, we also go, you know, cover many other aspects to include, you know, web, even a new cloud, uh, web app databases, everything else, including even a new cloud pen testing course as well. That's over on the right there written by uh, Moses Frost. Uh, and there's a new cert for that one as well, just to call that out since it's new, the GCPN. But one of the things that we noticed was in addition to these various areas, we needed to grow a little bit more to serve the purple team community, the red team community, specifically, uh, specifically in talking with Barrett, with George Archiles, uh, previously talking with uh, Joe Vest and James Tuberville also, we had a single course that uh, had started in the red team uh, area, but we wanted to grow the curriculum to be a little bit more comprehensive. So uh, Omar, can I ask you to, uh, to slide to uh, the second slide, please? So the second slide there now covers a little bit more of the, uh, whoop, are we on the foundational still? We're on foundational, yes. So next slide after this one, please. It should say specialized top left. There we go, that's the one, all right, perfect. All right, so let me, let me just chat about that one for a second, basically. So, you know, we wanted to add uh, additional uh, uh, breadth, depth uh, in the, uh, you know, offensive operations curriculum where it wasn't just pen testing uh, per se, basically, but we cover a lot of the different aspects. You know, red teaming, if you uh, read uh, George Archiles' course, basically, if you've taken the course, you understand, you know, we start with the, the scanning, the reconnaissance, basically, we move on to, you know, a little bit more of the, you know, the social, we move to the weaponization, we move to the delivery, we move to the reporting, the measurements, obviously, always working with the, uh, the blue team, measuring, training, trying to get better, basically. And one of the things that we have identified is that we need additional depth and breadth, basically, uh, on the red teaming side, in addition to the one course that's mentioned at the bottom right there, which is George Rochiles' course. Uh, and so we wanted to expand things uh, a little bit more. And that's what we've got with the various areas now. So top left there is the, the specialized pen testing area, variety of courses that are listed. I'll call out real quick just a couple things. Uh, the Security 467 course uh, written by Dave Shackelford and uh, James Leite Vidal actually goes live on September 8th. So that's in literally a month from now. So just wanted to alert the community about that. Also the uh, uh, Security 550, the Active Defense uh, Cyberspace Trapping, Attack Disruption and Cyber Deception course goes live on uh, November the 15th at our Pentest Hackfest event. We've been waiting for quite some time for that course to, uh, to come back basically, and it's finally made it back. 
And then finally, uh, last but not least, uh, it's listed, I think, on the next slide, but we've got an IoT pen testing course in addition to some additional uh, red team courses that are coming as well. For sure. We, it's, it's amazing how much specialization can happen with this, with this field. Um, you, we started with talking about the foundational uh, material. I, I, I've been teaching 660 for a bit now. And, uh, and just when you go to the talks, you see all the different villages. There's all these niches that people, people can dive in. So it's nice to see more and more material around the things that, that, that interest folks. Um, I know with 660, we, we have, a day, we have uh, half the course we talk about advanced pen testing, and then we get into exploit development. And, uh, and a story that Steve likes to tell when he wrote the course was he had, he had an idea for just an exploit development course uh, 10 years ago. And at the time, the community really wasn't ready just to, you know, the, the, there wasn't a big enough market just to do exploit development. And so 660 was born where we talked about advanced pen testing, talked about um, uh, exploit development. And it was also a little bit easier for folks to, to uh, get their employers to sponsor that because, you know, maybe they're in an offensive security role, but not necessarily something that warranted exploit development. Nowadays, you know, there's a huge market for exploit development, uh, people wanting that, that knowledge. And so, uh, you know, so you showed us what was the past. What's the future? What's this evolution in uh, in red team training from SANS? And so, uh, if we go to the the third slide here, thank you. There it is. Over on the right side, uh, we've got some new courses that are in development right now. I've alluded to a couple over on the left side, like at the bottom there, the IoT pen testing course. That one actually comes out on September 29th. It is live right now on the uh, the website. Larry Pesci, uh, James Leite, Vidal, and Steve Walbro just wrote that course, and it's going to be a, a great new course. Uh, in addition to that, though, over on the right side, top right, and specific to this community, to the red team and community, uh, we've got a brand new five-day red team operations course that's coming. Now, we've had red team operations courses, you know, previously, if you will. So at least the Security 564 course originally written by Joe Vest and James Tuberville back in 2016-2017 uh, timeframe, and then rewritten by George Orchiles, plus C2 matrix integration and a variety of other things basically that uh, enhanced that course uh, when it was rewritten in 2019 by George Orchiles. But we still only have a two-day course. And what we wanted to develop here was get a little bit more depth on the red teaming and get a little bit more breadth as well. And so uh, I will quickly highlight three courses and then I think, uh, best uh, thing I can do is I'll describe what I'm aware of, but I think Barrett's going to be a, the, the better person to ask about 565 uh, specifically. But 565, in summary, a five-day red team operations course, basically everything from the, you know, the concepts of red team operations and performing, you know, high value adversary emulation, all the way into the deep dive, basically, of using various tools, which ones work best in which situations, and then obviously doing what we do best, which is measuring people, processes, technology, everything else. And uh, obviously, you know, doing both the overall uh, uh, management of it, but most importantly, also the deep dive technical for growing red team operators as well. Uh, in addition to that, the course below it, uh, Security 670, uh, that's our uh, red team operations, uh, Windows uh, tool development, that course is currently in dev from Jonathan Ryder, and uh, he is taking time to cover what we consider a gap in offensive programming right now by essentially working on, you know, tool development, working on enumeration, working on, you know, gaining a foothold, basically, and then obviously just gaining, you know, persistence in the space, and then obviously more advanced techniques. And Ryder is uh, hoping to have that course out, I believe, uh, in the uh, Q4 uh, later part of this year. Finally, I'll list one more that's not currently listed on here, but it is a brand new development course as well. And that's Matt Toussaint's uh, Security 665, which is going to be an advanced red team operations course that's in very initial stages of development. But with that all said, I'm sitting next to the author of Security 565 Red Team Operations, the new five day course. I'd rather actually turn it around and ask you what's what's new, what's different between that Security 564 four, or, uh, 564 course of the past, the two-day version, and the new five-day version that you're writing in Security 565. Absolutely, so uh, we're, we're shooting for a Q1 next year uh, release uh, of, of the beta version of the course. So uh, what I've been working on is, is this five-day course with a six-day of, of a fully immersive environment. Um, the focus, uh, it's gonna be, it's, the title is Red Team Operations and Assume Breach. And, uh, and, and, and the course is, is, is um, is is uh, 
is sandwiched between some of those soft skills that are often overlooked when people think about red teaming, okay. right? Of course, you've got uh, the technical aspects of, of you know, having strong trade craft, uh, getting that initial foothold, doing that lateral movement, spending a lot of time in Active Directory, uh, you know, being comfortable with with the tools and the way that things are set up. But there's a lot about red teaming that I think uh, uh, can get overlooked, and and that's a uh, you know that's about really understanding what your purpose is as a red teamer. You know, why are you there uh, in the first place? Whether you're an internal red team uh, or a, a consulting red team, you know, you know, I often feel that your your goal is to make that blue team better. Right. Uh, if you if you do a pen test and you find a lot of uh, a lot of issues, you deliver those. There's not a whole lot of collaboration that happens. It kind of depends on uh, on the contract. But uh, but you might come back a year later and still see see some of those things. Uh, you know, a, as a red teamer, you want to do that adversary emulation. It's almost like giving the test to the blue team. Hey, this is these are the TTPs we're going to use. Uh, they're well documented. We're going to stick with this, and this is how you can you can grade your systems as long as uh, you know, we give you that scorecard of we're going to emulate this adversary. You can make sure all of your detection and response are set up properly. And so it's it's very specific. But what you know, what we can walk away from after that engagement is knowing that all of those controls are in place and they're working properly. Right? We're able to we're able to validate and test it. So uh, you know, I, I think some of that is important on the front and the back end, and then um, and then the three days in the middle, we're going to do a lot of deep dive into Active Directory, go beyond what uh, what we do in some of the other courses in SANS curriculum. Excellent. And uh, let's see here, we did we talk uh, about the um, the Purple Team Tactics course? We did not yet, actually. So there are uh, two existing Purple Team courses right now. So there's Security uh, 599, uh, written by uh, the Inviso team, basically, mm -hmm. but uh, Eric Van Buggenout and Steve Sims. And that course essentially goes into, you know, all the different uh, techniques that adversaries use, specifically advanced adversaries, but then each step in the kill chain, how defenders can actually help stop the adversaries as early in the kill chain uh, as possible. And then, of course, there's another uh, course uh, right on the tail of that, the Security 699 mm -hmm. uh, Purple Team Tactics uh, course. That one's written by Eric Van Buggenout of the Inviso team again and uh, uh, Jim Shoemaker as well uh, of SANS. And uh, that course is a little bit more on the red side, more with emulating specific adversaries. So I want to say, and I'm going off memory here, he emulates three to four different uh, uh, you know, advanced uh, groups, if you will, basically, mm -hmm. threat actor groups, and then actually walks through and helps individuals to prep from both the red team perspective of emulating them and then obviously you know what you would do for to help the purple team side as well basically or to help both the uh the red and the blue side as well yeah i'm i'm really excited about the way that the curriculum is just expanding and, and going deeper into all these uh all these different topics uh, another thing we've done uh with the offensive operations curriculum is we have a discord server out there um it allows it allows students to communicate with instructors uh, instructors after the course is done um, we obviously have our platform that we use when we do the training, but but this is great to uh, to circle back with folks. You can you can reach out to the instructors, uh, can, you know, kind of talk about what you've used after the course, uh, and so that that that's out there on Discord. Uh, I'll I'll put a link out on our um, um, on on our platform later. And uh, are there any other resources that SANS has? Yeah, in addition to the Discord, which I think that's you and that's John uh, Gornflow, right? I yep. believe uh, in addition to that, we've also got SANS.org free. Uh, and that's just simply sans.org slash free, basically. Anyone can go there, whether you're looking for webcasts, posters, you know, various distributions to include uh, one that we have called Slingshot, basically. Uh, that's a, a you know multi-use uh, distribution, basically whether there's white papers, blog articles, or blogs, sorry, uh, white papers, anything else that you're looking for, uh, whether you're new to cyber or experienced and you're just looking for more things, more uh, details basically, or more depth, it's all available at sans.org slash free. Uh, also, one last thing that I'll put out there as well, there's some free CTFs that they're doing these days as well. So Ed Scotus and uh, the team, basically Simon Byrne and several others just did one for the uh, uh, DEF CON event and Black Hat event that was going on. In addition to that, uh, it always puts on, uh, and Counteract always puts on the SANS Holiday Hack Challenge. Mm -hmm. So be aware of that. That will also be listed and tied into SANS.org free as well. Great. I appreciate you coming out. Hey, and thank you for having me. Uh, while we're here, I want to do one more thing, and that is uh, I know we recently announced on the website uh, that we had uh, 
certified you as an instructor. Again, that was totally unrelated to uh, to me coming out here, but it was nice because all the stars actually aligned for once instead of taking six months between when we see each other and whatever else uh, may happen. But I got a call from Lisa Peterson, who is somebody that I know you know very well and all of our SANS instructors know very well. And she truly has been the Sherpa is probably the best way to put it to get instructors from you know new instructors all the way through certified status. She is just good people for always guiding somebody through the various wickets of the process and everything mm -hmm. else and pitfalls of the process mm -hmm. as well and getting people from A to Z. She called me specifically and asked if she could bring me something because she knew I was gonna come out and see you. And that is, I've got a plaque all here. Right. That is your SANS certified instructor plaque. And I know we announced it to you a week ago and we changed the website, but I wanted to say congrats. Hey, thanks. And seriously, thanks this for all great. you do. Thanks for everything that you are doing to increase the knowledge in the community, to increase, you know, obviously people's awareness of, you know, uh, things such as the 660 course that you and uh, Steve Sims and many others, Jim Schumacher, many others teach. But in addition to that, uh, the work that you're doing on the red team side as well, and with the course that you're writing as well. So uh, definitely look forward to many other great things to come. And uh, thank you again. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks. I appreciate it. Oh, I'm going to kick it back over to Omar in the studio. We are going to close out this stream because coming up next is our joint panel with the AI Village. And we are we're going to finish out for today. Uh, for all the players that are in finals right now, keep that communication uh, on Discord if you if you run to any issues. Uh, thank you for for uh, signing up with the finals. As I mentioned, I just wanna say this one more time, we are gonna leave the scenario up because there's a lot going on there. Um, despite the fact that we're we're doing the hybrid uh, event here, we will, we will leave everything up. It'll be minimally supported, but then we're gonna finish things uh, up tomorrow morning and, uh, and see how everyone's doing. So, so back to you, Omar. Awesome, thank you so much and congratulations again. Hey, that thanks. Was, that was awesome. Actually, can you show the, 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 pla the, pla the Okay, there, like <laughs> sure. the microphones in the front. There you go. All right, then. Yeah, sir. I'm actually taking a picture right now. I'll do that. Awesome. I am doing that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, uh, funny IP or Barrett, you know, mention, um, please uh, check out the scoreboard. It's in the bottom of their screen. Please continue to communicate with each other. Even though, you know, we're in the finals, go to the red, to the red team village. CTF channel in the Discord server from DEF CON. And with that, uh, congratulations again. And we go in a break in a few seconds. Thanks again. Thank you, Ken, for having me.